bullshit. This was a pretty damn good show, I will say that. It's one of, when you think about how horrible they usually are building pay-per-views, this may have been their best go-home show ever. Yeah. And the show ended. Well, no, I can't say that, because the last segment The last sucked. segment was goddamn awful. The last segment was, was bullshit. I mean, l- listen, if you didn't watch the part on the show where they ran down the pay-per-view matches, literally until the final segment, you would have had absolutely no idea that the main event on the show is a four-way. And then, wait till you see how they built up this four-way. They promoted the undercard very well throughout the show. Yes. So, show opened with Anderson and uh, Jeff Hardy having a confrontation. Apparently, Anderson hit Jeff with a chair on accident last week. He said that's what happened here. And then he said they were going to wrestle later, and they would be there would be a chair there, but he wasn't going to use it, or Jeff might. I really have no idea what he was saying. Um, and then he left, and... You said, I have no idea what he's talking about, and I said, I don't either. And then Taz said he had no idea what was going on. Taz said, I quote, what does that mean? Yes. What is he talking about? So this promo failed. Well, as Dixie says, you know, things don't have to make sense. But she also said it's entertainment, and this is not entertain me. AJ did a promo talking to, I have absolutely no idea who, <laughs> he was, saying he was going to kill Kazarian. He was going to tear Kazarian apart. Then we got a brief promo with Jeff Hardy. I'm just going to quote him here. Anytime I get hit with a chair, I always question the person who swung it. <laughs> a fortune cookie, this is. Kazarian and AJ with Flair watching. I think AJ is a heel, but he did all of his baby face spots. You never tell. They had a good back and forth match. Kazarian went for the one man Spanish fly. AJ cut him off, fell into the ring, hit the Pele kick. Kazarian fucking killed him with a DDT on the apron. Like sucks. Remember when I used to rant and rave every week about how stupid AJ Styles was for just killing himself with these stupid bumps, and how he took, like, the power bomb into the edge of the barricade that one time yes, and all this yes. other stupid shit? And then for, like, years... He got smart. He got really smart. And then I watched him take this DT on the apron, which has no give, and which he hit face first. This was CTE City. Just bullshit. Yeah. And then AJ sold this for about two seconds, then they started brawling and got counted out. They kept on fighting. Yeah. Flair got in the ring and told them to, and I quote, quit dicking around. This match was so good that I can't even hate how bad that finish was. It was, well, yeah. Not it, selling a DDT on the apron. This, this, that. I should be more angry than I am, but this, the match was good enough that I don't care. This looked more devastating than the kick into the post that had Hernandez out for months. Yeah. And so, yes, uh, Flair told him to quit dicking around. He Basically, the story is Flair's forming a group, and he's recruiting talent, and uh, he's interested in AJ and Kazarian, but they still have something to prove. So he has booked them against a mystery team in the pay-per-view and said they had better win. Oh, yeah, and by the way, um, he said that their opponents, they'll find out who they are at the pay-per-view. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I After all these years, after seeing Cyber Sunday fail year after year after year, is it still a mystery to these people that people don't buy a show when they don't know who people are going to face? All right, who are you talking about? Still. They, they don't know what they're doing. And and you're making the crucial mistake you're carrying again. I'm trying not to here. Plus, I, I assume that whoever they're going to bring in, I don't think they're a team. I don't think it's, I don't know what team would I advise. Um, the Harris Twins, <laughs> it's, not going to be, it's not going to be a team that anyone would pay to see anyway. Angelina so. Love faced Daphne. Now listen. I got some emails that actually said, Brian, if you don't like this show, like, if you don't like this show, I mean, you've, whatever, blah, 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 you've got to be biased, this and that. Listen, anybody who liked Angelina Love versus Daphne, you're a liar, okay? It's impossible to like this match. Daphne is horrible. God bless her. If you think she's cute, fine. If you're a fan of her character, fine. She is an awful professional wrestler. If Percy Watson does not does not improve for 10 years, he may still be better than Daffy. 10 years she's been in this business. She cannot hit the ropes. She, she has bad timing. Uh, her selling looks bad. I watched her this. offense looks bad. All I could think was, think of the women who have come and gone in this company for various reasons. Some of their own choosing. Yeah, they got rid of, of, um, of Roxy. Uh, Roxy. They got rid of, well, they get rid of ODB is gone. Yeah. Gail Kim is gone. Awesome Kong is gone. Daphne is still here. 
This sure, is I'm bullshit. sure she's a wonderful girl. She really is a nice girl. She's a terrible horrible wrestler. in the ring. Horrible awful. in the ring. So, so they had a match. Angelina won. And then she did a promo saying, Madison was probably watching from home because she didn't have the balls to show up. Like, I guess this was supposed to be an insult that Madison does not have balls. Well, Madison apparently has balls because she did show up. I would think if Madison had balls, that would be an insult. That would mean she's a tranny. So she comes out and I guess she does have balls, as noted, and said, if I'm putting my title on the line, you need to risk something. Why? I don't know. So she said, are you going to put your fake tits on the line or that cheap weave? And then she decided you need to put your career on the line. So, again, lame stip, adding zero buys, and Angelina said she'd predicted Madison would do something like this, which, if true, she should be working for the Inquirer. She said that she had met with the TNA management earlier in the day, and she said if Velvet or Lacey interfered, Madison would be disqualified and Angelina would get the title. Angelina's the baby face, everybody. And she wants to win the title by DQ. Yeah. I can deal with that because that, that, that at least is just an insurance policy to guarantee there will be no interference. Fine. But Madison, upon being told that she had no, she would get no interference and had to fight for herself, was confident and smiled. Mm-hmm. And she's supposed to be the heel. Yeah. They don't know what they're doing. This is also, by the way, uh, the, before they went to commercial, we got a shot of Angelina Love changing clothes. Uh, we saw her topless back. This was so unbelievably not sexy. Yeah. This woman's going to die. Yeah, I She's know about that. But... Anorexic and ill. Devon came out and did a promo. And Jesse Neal and Shannon were in the ring with him. And Devon said things were out of control. He wanted his brother to come down so they can deal with this right now. So Bubba came out, and Devon did the big speech about how they trained Jesse just like they were trained. They gave him every bit of knowledge they had. He'd shown nothing but respect. Talked about how he'd been in the Navy. He was working on a ship, and it was blown up by terrorists. At which point the fans went, boo! Boo murder! That was just weird for some reason. It's very weird. I don't like it when they bring this into storylines, because then you have an incident where they talk about a boat being blown up by terrorists, which actually happened, and the fans go, boo! Yes, and so and people actually did die, and these and the, and the fans reacted in the exact same way that you would do if they saw someone, for example, pulling hair. So he asked what Bubba's problem was with Jesse. Bubba said he didn't answer to Devon because he was Bubba Ray, the team leader. Devon needed to answer to him. He said his problem wasn't with Jesse, it was with Devon for being a disrespectful partner. And he said he talked to Eric, and I'm a little unclear here. I'm not sure if it's this Sunday or at the next pay-per-view. Anyway, it's going to be Bubba, <laughs> Jesse, and Devon in a three-way. What makes you think it would be the next pay-per-view? I don't know. I thought that's what he said. Hmm. At the next pay-per-view. I did not get that impression. Hmm. Anyway. But, yes, yeah, so they're doing a three-way. Uh, and and, and, and the, the, the deal was to set it up. Bubba demanded to know who Devon was loyal to. He said he was loyal to both. And Bubba said, well, well there's going to be a three-way, so we'll find out who you're loyal to, and we will either be the best head team ever will continue or we'll die. Mm-hmm. And Devon was unhappy. So Team 3D pretty much always cut great promos, so I was fine with this. It does kind of suck to be Shannon Moore, the ultimate fourth wheel, which is usually, you know, the fourth wheel. You want four wheels, but it sucks to be him. RVD and Samoa Joe... Had an awesome match. God damn, this was great. They went back and forth. The ECW dudes showed up. Tanay keeps grilling Taz about this, and Taz said he has no idea why these people are here. Tanay's like, well, you were the best man at Dreamer's wedding. And Taz is like, that was ten years ago, and he would not be my best man today. But Tanay would not let it go. So they had this match. RVD went for Rolling Thunder, got an STU out of the corner, the one thing about this match, there were two things that I must critique here that I was not a fan of. Number one, the finish was Joe putting him in a choke and RVD running up the ropes, pushing off, ending up in pinning position. The same finish as the Steve Bret Austin, Austin and Bret Hart at Survivor Series 15 years ago, which, by the way, I still remember. So they do that spot, but it was very clunky. It was not Bret Hart and they Steve Austin. They are not Bret Hart and Steve Austin, no. no. That was my one. Uh, and the other complaint I had was, Maybe it's just me, but, like, when you watch a Samoa Joe match, or really anybody, everybody has spots that they do. Shawn Michaels does the flying forearm and the kip-up. Triple H does the high knee and the the face buster on the knee. Hulk Hogan does the Hulk up and the punches. Everybody has their moves that they do in their match. Samoa Joe does as well. He's got the, uh, 
you know, the STO as they come into the corner. He's got the deal where they do the cradle and he pulls him into the sleeper. He does all sorts of stuff. I don't know if RVD does not watch Samoa Joe matches, but Joe is setting up all these spots he always does, and RVD seemed to have absolutely no idea what was coming. Do you know what's that? Samoa Joe had to pull him so fucking hard back into that choke. Yes. Because they did the roll, and they were doing the reversal, and RVD just sat there as opposed to going back, and Joe finally grabbed him and yanked him I, down. I believe he actually pulled him down by the ponytail. Yes. I, I, I think this is – RVD was doing the kind of thing that we used to yell at Kennedy for – where he has to fight back to make it look real, and instead it just looks not as good? No, but, I, I don't see it that way at all. I, I see it like he was not quite sure what was supposed to be coming next, which if you've watched five Samoa Joe matches, it should not be a mystery. Yeah. Anyway, this was still two thumbs they up. They still had a very good match. The, the best thing about it was, besides this in general being good, uh, it was basically a longer version of, the, uh, of, of Carwin Lesnar, really, because it was Joe beating Rob's ass most of the time, and every time Rob would go for one of his moves, Joe would cut him off immediately. He, uh, Rob went for the uh, uh, the somersault monkey flip, and that's where he ate, ate the SEO. Rob went for a dive and missed, and so Joe hit one. And so Joe was getting the upper hand all the way through, and he made one mistake, and Rob won. With the counter, by the way, that as Taz noted, I think Rob broke his neck or something like, something like that. But match was good. It told a good story. Joe was beating up the champion until he made one mistake and got beat, and he was frustrated, and he killed the referee in rage. So presumably Dixie is going to suspend him now for this. <laughs> of course not. So consistent with the storylines. Yeah. Yes. So well, presumably Rob will retain the pay per view and Joe will get the next title shot. But who knows? Why would Joe get the uh, next title shot? He, the, 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 the way they built this has to be because he, he was he was destroying the champion and uh, you know, and he, he didn't, lost and he lost. So he shouldn't get the next title shot. Yeah, you're right. Besides, this is what they have a top ten for. Angle did a promo. Talking about how he's working his way up the ladder because he liked the pressure. Likes it so much he's putting his career on the line. So, yes, for those of you keeping track, at the pay-per-view this Sunday that no one is going to buy, two people are putting their career on the line. Yeah. Do you want Maybe to if they spent some time trying to make stipulations mean something as opposed to just throwing out a million of them, and which brings us to the next match, in fact. <laughs> this... Douglas Williams. This is just astounding. This may have been this, uh, a stupid, the stupidest thing on the show, actually. I think, I think actually this was the dumbest thing on the entire show. Douglas Williams versus, versus one of the Young Bucks in a ladder match. So, why is this a ladder match, you ask? Okay, I'll explain. Apparently, the gimmick is that Douglas Williams is afraid of heights, and that's leading to the Ultimate X match with Kendrick on Sunday. Now, it would be one thing if, like, the heel was afraid of heights in a match where he had to go up high. No. The ultimate X rules are you can either scale the cables or you can just win via submission. Yes. So he doesn't have to climb at all. No. Which begs the question, why are they doing a gimmick where he's afraid of heights? Because they're retarded. So they do this match, and <laughs> Douglas gets the advantage, and he goes to climb. And he gets to the first rung. Yes. He is not even one foot off the ground, and he gets scared. He gets sweaty. He yes. starts to shake. This was so stupid. So, eventually, of course, the buck wins. And Of course, you say. Like, we were supposed to assume that the champion would win a match going into the pay-per-view. Now, here's why it's so stupid about it. <laughs> they are doing a match that... It's supposed to be spectacular. And the gimmick is that it won't be because one guy is afraid of what makes it spectacular. Yes. How are you even attempting to sell this match? <laughs> I don't know. It, it, I, <laughs> this was mystifying. <laughs> this was, <laughs> there was everything about this was done as stupidly as possible. This would be like saying... We are going to book Triple H versus Shawn Michaels in a hair versus hair match. But we're going to do it on a secluded island that does not have electricity. So the razor's not going to work. Who would buy the fucking show? We're going to have an Ultimate X match, which the whole idea is you're scaling these cables, it's up high, people are going to fall from great heights, yet the gimmick is one guy so scared of heights... Did he even get to try and climb? 
And he is given the option to win another way. Yeah. So his finger fights, unless he's stupid. This goes, really was one of the dumbest segments in years, I think, in this company. And then, as noted, yes, the champion lost to a guy who was not on the pay-per-view going into the show. I also, and this is in a long list of things here, a nitpick. But seconds after being scared on the bottom rung of the ladder, one was responded by climbing to the middle rope for some offense. Yeah. Which is much higher than the bottom rung. So, yes, as noted, everything that could have been done stupidly here was, in fact, done stupidly. This may have been the perfect impact segment. Goofy segment with Alex Shelley. They had a public service announcement about how you should not drink beer or apparently make money. <laughs> beer and money are bad for you. This was an awesome video that was on the Internet, I swear to God, like three months ago. And it finally made TV. Let me tell you why I hate Vince Russo and this writing crew. Because they put so much thought into that stupid ladder match, which was so goddamn stupid and made no sense and didn't sell a single buy. And then in the next match, it's Machine Guns versus... Uh, Machine Guns and Hernandez versus Beer Money and Matt Morgan. All they did was they sent them out there, and the Machine Guns and Beer Money had an awesome match together. And when it was over, I wanted to buy the pay-per-view for that fucking match. Yeah. I want to buy the pay In fact, I'm going to, obviously. But I, I may, in fact, if this were not my job... I may, in fact, have bought this pay-per-view either way just to see the Machine Guns versus Beer Money. And how did they convince me to buy that? They didn't do anything. They just put the motherfuckers in a match and had them work for a while, and that convinced me to buy the goddamn show. Get rid of these stupid writers. Just let the wrestlers write the show. Yes, the the gimmick here was a six-man tag. It was Morgan and Beer Money against the Guns and Hernandez. It was really good whenever Morgan wasn't in there. Uh, They... Kept Hernandez in the apron, apron the entire time until the hot tag. He ran wild and everybody, and then he looked around for Morgan to kill, and Morgan was happy up the ramp, so he chased him out of there. And then it was just the guns and beer money, and that was great. And it ended with uh, Rude pinning Shelly holding the tights. Storm tried to use beer, but Saban thwarted him, wiped him out with a dive. Shelly tried a high cross. Rude rolled through, one, two, three with the tights. This fucking match was awesome, and I cannot wait! And they're going to do it again. For this match on Sunday. Yes. If they... Oh, I don't even want to think about it. If they fuck that match up somehow by having a bunch of geeks run in or something stupid, I'm going to be so pissed off. I will call the cable company again and ask for a refund. Live here on the air. Speaking of pissed off, Kevin Nash was angry. You're missing the Pope. He did a promo backstage. Pope did a promo. This is awesome. I... He goes, I'm not clear to wrestle, but I'm going to be wrestling Kurt on Sunday. I guess you can just predict when you will be cleared. I don't know. I don't know. He also reminded us that Anderson Kurt's career is take... on the line. Yes. Mm-hmm. He very casually mentioned that. I don't think it was mentioned anywhere else in the show. Yeah. That they're multi-time world champion gold he medalist. He end the career of Kurt Angle, and he didn't it's, care it's, at it, all. No one cared. No. No one cared. Yeah. And this is a good impact. Yeah. Kevin Nash is in a room backstage speaking directly to the camera, bitching about something. Hogan came in, and they bitched about Scott Hall. and No, this was awesome. <laughs> they were talking about WCW from 15 years ago. Which, by the way, the youngest people in the 18 to 34 demographic were three then. And Hogan walked in, and he said, this is a different time. Really? You would (laughs) never know from watching Impact. (laughs) Then we had, someone please get me an MP3 of this immediately. I think this was maybe the best promo of the year in professional wrestling. There may have been a better one in MMA, but in pro wrestling, this was the best promo of the year. Jay Lethal came out and talked about the match. He said he was so excited when he heard he was going to wrestle Flair, but then the great feeling was taken away when they beat up his brother Muhammad. And he said, do people know what that's like? Which actually was funny because I've seen Tony get his ass kicked in jiu-jitsu a number of times. It is fucking hilarious. But this made Jay Lethal mad. Brothers do usually like to see their brothers get beaten up. He said, I have something I want to say to my mom. And the fans went dead silent, waiting to hear what he had to say. That was awesome. So he said he was going to make her the proudest mom in the world when he beat Flair at the pay-per-view. And even though she was a 1,000 miles away, she was always going to be in his heart, standing next to him. And then Ric Flair's music hit. I wish we had the MP3 because I could not do this justice. No. I think this was the best crazy Ric Flair promo ever. Flair said... I could give a rat's ass about your mother. He said, the old lady was living vicariously through Jay because she wanted Rick. 
He said he was Rick fucking Flair. He said his role from Mania was at the Smithsonian, which was, quote, for dead people or for people who are real famous. He said Lethal grew up in a nice family, but his mom and dad put him on the road at 15, and he'd been limousine riding ever since. He said he would go to the psychiatrist, and after an hour of talking to them, they would be lying on the goddamn couch because he was crazy. <laughs> That's what he said. He said if a woman had felt the crest of the nature boy, she was scathed for life. I don't know what that means, but he delivered it great. He explained that he had an ex-wife out there who was walking around her bedroom missing him. Yes. Wondering where he was every night. <laughs> said Lethal dressed like a street punk. He didn't belong in the same ring with him. He said he had three days to think about it. He said he, Ric Flair, was not human. He was a god. Any woman he wanted, he said. Just like that girl in the front row. A living, breathing machine. There were hospitals around the world, he said, that wanted him to donate his body parts so they could see what made him go. At which point he said, Yeah! Yeah! Said Lethal couldn't do a thing to him. He'd been cut. He'd crashed planes. He'd been wrecked in cars. He'd been struck by lightning. I missed that one. And in three days, Jay Lethal was going to meet God. This fucking promo was this awesome. Was the, this was a money promo. This was literally, this was the best fucking promo of 2010. Yeah. I can't even think of anything that even came close to this fucking promo. It's This was an example of, it's too bad that this show has been so awful for so long and nobody watches it. Mm -hmm. Because if people actually watched this show in real numbers, this fucking pay-per-view would do 100,000 buys. Because of this fucking promo alone. But it's the same people watching it that always do, and it's going to do 15,000, and that's too bad. Mm -hmm. But this was the best. It was the best. really, really awesome. If I had a nitpick, it did leave. God bless Jay Lethal. He's not cool enough to hang with Ric Flair. No, no. one, no one is. But yeah, well, no one is. Yeah, he did, he did fine. He, he came Many off. people would have been far more overshadowed than Jay Lethal was here. So, I thought this was great. It was. I, and I unfortunately, was we should have turned the show off here. Yes, because then we got the stupid ass final segment, which was Mr. Anderson versus Jeff Hardy. I have no idea why they're wrestling. Apparently, because Anderson accidentally hit him with a chair. They went maybe three minutes. It seemed like it was about two. Jeff pins him with the twist of fate, offers a handshake, and out comes Abyss with a nail-covered board. Now, last week on the show, and I don't even know why I'm asking this question, because the answer is because they're fucking morons, but last week on the show, Dixie Carter suspended Sting for 30 days. Why? I don't know. Because he choked her a long time ago, and he tore out Jeff Jarrett's shoulder or something like that. So meanwhile, every week, Abyss is coming to the ring with a board with nails in it. Sure. Nothing can be done about this. No. The man has not been suspended. He has not been banned from bringing a fucking board filled with nails to the ring. So he comes out with this goddamn board. And, uh, and the ref just grabs it. <laughs> I'm right. not making this up. Abyss has a board in his hand that has nails sticking out of it. He gets in the ring. The referee walks up to him, grabs the board, and takes it out of his hand. Right. That's, that really happened. <laughs> so now he's boardless. And so now both baby faces attack him two on one. From behind. Abyss the heel makes his own comeback. Shit doesn't have to make sense. It's entertainment. So... When the ref took the board away from him, nonchalantly, I might add, he proceeded to just place it on the ramp outside the ring. Yeah. So Abyss, all by himself, beats up both guys, and then just walks out and picks up the board with the nails in it. That, to me, was the most offensive part in this entire segment. The referee took the time to disarm this man, and then set the board down right there. It's like if you, if, um, if you, if you, if you taser a man, a criminal, you put the cuffs on him, and you put them in, like, in, in the front of him, you put him in the back seat of the cop car, and then you toss a gun into his yes. lap. <laughs> yes. Fucking idiots. So he gets the board, he tries to hit somebody, it hits the buckle, and at that point, RVD's music hits. You see, RVD has seen all of this, and there's a man in the ring with a fucking board covered in nails, and RVD decides, now's my chance. Now's my chance to run down there after he's beaten up two baby faces single-handedly and he's got a board covered with nails. So RVD, the fucking dumbest guy in the world, runs down to the ring 
And Abyss proceeds to take the board covered in nails, and he just throws it out of the ring or something. Because he'll have a fair fight. Why not? So he has a fair fight with Rob Van Dam. They're beating on each other one-on-one. Anderson grabs a chair. He teases he's going to hit Jeff Hardy, but then he says, No, Jeff, move! So Jeff moves. Mr. Anderson hits Abyss with the chair. All the baby faces team up at Abyss on, and clean him out of the ring. So, yes, the final build towards the pay-per-view is that there's a four-way in the main event, and three of the four men are forming an alliance. Yes. What? To get rid of one man, who is the guy we're supposed to hate? They don't know what they're doing. They're I not... cannot even conceive of writing something this stupid. <laughs> and and I still don't think it was the stupidest thing on the show. Oh, yeah. For sure the ladder match thing was dumber. This may have, this may have been worse because it was the main event, but that was stupider. I was just talking to someone the other day, and they're like, Russo wants out. And I'm like, it's fucking unanimous, so get out! Just quit. And then it's always like, well, they need someone to replace him. Really? The janitor. Velvet Sky. I can think I can think of a billion people that should replace Vince Russo. But they can't find anyone. I'm done. This was a good impact. Watch the entire thing, turn it skip the ladder match thing, or you're gonna get pissed off, and turn it off after the Ric Flair promo, and you'll think it's the best T V show of the year. Don't watch the last segment. For God's sake. To the back! It's not the worst pay-per-view of the year. I saw some people that that hated it a lot more than I did. And uh, I think the story of it was that the first half was really bad. It was a complete Vince Russo show. Second half was booked by somebody with a clue until the main event, which there's nothing really wrong with the main event. It was perfectly fine for, like, an impact match. Mm -hmm. But it was like the main event of a pay-per-view. Yes. And then when it was over, the show ended. I don't know. It it was not a main event worth paying for. Let me tell you something, everybody. Some people got excited because Eric Bischoff put on his Twitter that there was big news, and he had a picture of, like, a lamp and and an island and the wing of an airplane. And we were supposed to put all these clues together to find out what the surprise was. I have no idea what he thought the surprise was going to be. He later said that it actually was not a surprise he had promised, but news. At the end of the day, there was no surprise and there was no news, unless the news was we put on a lackluster pay-per-view. And I can't figure out how you get that out of the pictures that he put up there, but everybody... I guess we're not as smart as him. Please, do me a favor. Stop getting excited about Dixie and Eric Bischoff tweeting that big surprises and big things are coming. It never happened. This is like... This is like... Remember we had Granny on the show the other day, and we asked her, someone asked, is the world going to end in 2012? And she's like, I heard that when I was a little kid. Yeah, you know, people heard about that shortly after Christ passed away, okay? It's been 2,000 years. Every 50 years or so, the end of the world is coming. It still hasn't come yet, and it ain't coming anytime soon. Just like big news, big news is going to turn TNA upside down, is not coming anytime soon. Let's talk about this show. It's kind of sad because on paper, I was expecting this to be a thumbs-up show. Listen to the Observer. I, I was cautiously optimistic. I thought if they just let these guys have matches that it would be a good show. And guess what? By and large, they didn't. Well, the guys, there were there were three matches on this show that were well worth the purchase price. Unfortunately, there were nine matches on this show. <laughs> so that leaves six that uh, left a lot to be desired. The opener was Doug Williams and Brian Kendrick for the X title in an Ultimate X match where you could win by grabbing the X from the cables or via submission. Right. Now, as I talked about on the show a couple of days ago, what a stupid match. (laughs) The gimmick is that Doug Williams is afraid of heights. And so what you were promising people was, here is a match that should be spectacular. It's Ultimate X. People buy it because of the spectacular nature of the match. But you've told people that one guy is too scared to go on the cables. Might as well say we're going to have a cage match, but the cage is made of straw. So they do this match, and, of course, Doug Williams is too afraid to climb. So they basically do a submission match, which begs the question, why didn't you just do a submission match? Because the Ultimate X Stips didn't sell a single pay-per-view. So they do a submission match, and finally, at the end of the match, Doug Williams actually begins to climb. He starts scaling the cables... 
And by the way, there was no explanation for why all of a sudden Douglas Williams was no longer afraid of heights. He just wasn't. He just started to climb. So he's scaling the cables. Brian Kendrick goes after him. They're both hanging from the cables. I want everyone to envision this. Imagine there's a cable hanging from the ceiling or a monkey bar, whatever it might be, and you and your friend are both hanging from it. And you both let go. You both fall about seven feet. You both land on your feet and fall down. That's what happened here. They didn't take a flat back bump, nothing. They were both hanging from the cables, and they both fell down and landed on their feet and collapsed. Somehow, Brian Kendrick was killed. <laughs> and Doug Williams was totally fine. Yes. Doug Williams got up. He put Brian Kendrick in Brian Kendrick's own Cobra clutch. Brian Kendrick was unconscious, and so the match was stopped. They actually found a finish so stupid <laughs> that when thinking about how dumb this match was, I never would have thought of this in my entire it, life. They sur- served you. I, maybe he had a heart attack? Maybe this is the big news. We found a shitty finish. Maybe his brains were in his feet, and so he landed on them and was knocked out. I don't know what happened here, but Brian Kendrick lost this match. If you, I know you said that the Ultimate X sold zero buys, but if there's one person out there who paid money to see the spectacular Ultimate X match, they got nothing. They got nothing. There was one, Brian Kendrick took one bump off the support onto the apron, which is much, he's not landed on his feet on the apron, I should mention. And then they did that one spot where they were both hanging and both landed on their feet. And Actually, that was he it. necked the top rope, so when he, when he fell off the, the barrack or the, 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 whatever the thing was, the tower, he should have been killed there. And he got knocked unconscious by falling and landing on his feet on the mat. Yeah. Anyway, so, I gave it two and a quarter stars. The guys worked really hard. They worked really hard. I only went star and a half. It was dumb. They, I, it was very dumb, and Kendrick went for the Cobra Clutch approximately 2,000 times in this five-minute match. And it came off like one of those guys. You know when you watch an MMA fight where a guy goes for a guillotine doesn't get it? So he tries another guillotine and a third guillotine, and that's all he knows? That's what Kendrick looked like here. Christy interviewed Team 3D. And we had a fine TNA moment as Bubba buried her and manhandled her and told her that she was a failure and said that Jesse Neal was a failure, quote, just like his dead friend. Lovely. So we've got a dead human used in a stupid storyline and abuse against women. I have no idea what's wrong with these writers, but we see this all the time. Bubba versus Jesse versus Devon. Bubba attacked Jesse who's come down the ramp and Devon was nowhere to be seen. They cut backstage. There's Devon apparently behind a closed door. The door has been, has been. I don't know what it's been. The door reads Team 3D, and there's like a two by four across sure. it or something. He was locked in essentially. He's screaming, "Let me out!" And so the cameraman filmed this. It wasn't just like for a second. The cameraman kept it on on the split screen for like 30 seconds. Yes. And you just hear Devon going, "Let me out! God damn it! Let me out!" And the cameraman just films him. So the cameraman's a dick. He uh, finally gets out eventually after Devon, after Bubba and... Bubba and, killed Jesse for five minutes. Yep. So Jesse makes a big comeback, and Devon finally comes out. They go face-to-face, Bubba and Devon. Then they both turn and look at Jesse in an evil manner, like, oh, it's a swerve, we're going to beat him up. Amazingly, it was not a swerve, as Bubba tried to punch Devon, Devon blocked it, started punching Bubba, and then Jesse tried to spear Bubba, but he accidentally speared Devon. And then Bubba hit Jesse with the full Nelson ass buster and pinned him. Because they did not do the most obvious swerve imaginable, I was fine with this. And the fans responded by chanting ECW. I have no idea why. The ECW guys were out there. They had nothing to do with the finish. No. I gave it a star and a half. That's actually exactly what I did, too. Although I think I would have rather just had Team 3D just team up and take out Jesse. Because why? I mean, or why not? So now we have apparently Jesse, or we have Devon apparently feuding with Bubba, and Jesse is just a geek who got beat up five minutes and pinned. Then we had a match that actually was even stupider than the than anything else. Anything else on this show? This was astounding. So we had Madison Rain against Angelina Love for the Knockouts title, where if Angelina did not win, she had to retire forever. So. The other stipulation was that if the beautiful people interfered, Madison would lose her title on a DQ. So again, if Velvet Sky or Lacey Von Erich interfered in this match, Madison would lose the belt on the DQ. Now, the stipulations are clear. 
They had a match. Madison rakes her eyes right in front of the ref to get the heat. It was a show. This this entire show was about it, completely incompetent referees until the, the tag title match when they actually had referees that had a clue. But up and down this show, people were interfering right in front of the ref. People were beating each other up outside the ring right in front of the ref. Dudes were running in right in front of the ref. The ref let all of this go. And yet, we forgot to mention this, in the 3D match, there was a point where Bubba went to get a chair, and Shannon Moore had to come down and distract the ref so that Bubba could use this by yeah. being dehued. We forgot about that, but there was something stupid that happened. So anyway, I would just like to note, I was reading some old observers. Do you know that WCW, this is WCW, mind you. They've been dead a long time. They used to retape matches if a referee was in the wrong position and saw a heel cheat. WCW! would retape the matches if a referee appeared incompetent on their TV. Not TNA! No. There's incompetent referees in every single match. So anyway, they do this match. It's kind of bad. I've seen worse. And finally, Madison gets a chair, which the ref tells her she can't use. But Angelina kicks it right in front of her, right into her face in front of the referee. No DQ. So finally, some chick on a motorcycle comes out. Say that again. A chick on a motorcycle in a helmet zooms right. down the aisle. A motorcycle down to ringside. Not even down the rampway, like through the building. She couldn't just come out like in a mask. I mean, they, they wanted to they wanted to make us understand why she was wearing a helmet by actually putting her on a motorcycle. Yes. Now now how this person you know, apparently there's no security backstage. Apparently there was nobody guarding the entranceway. No. For forget backstage. This is she was in with the fans. Yeah. Apparently you could just bring motorcycles into the impact zone. Gets better. She zooms into the building on a motorcycle in a helmet. She grabs Angelina and throws her into the post. Right in front of the referee who does not disqualify her. So the ref, after seeing this motorcycle woman throw the challenger into the post right in front of his eyes, he goes out there and says, you must leave. The motorcycle girl proceeds to throw him down. Finally, he's had enough. She touched me. Now we must DQ her. So he DQs Madison, and then he goes to speak to the referee. The announcer. The, the announcer. Now, now, by the way, Madison as soon as the bell rings, is all happy. Because, of course, the stips are that it has to be either Velvet Sky or Lacey Von Eric in order for her to lose her title on a DQ. So Borash then announces the winner of this match as a result of a disqualification and the new TNA Knockouts champion, Angelina Love. And Madison Rain is like, what? How do you know that it was Velvet or Lacey? She's wearing a helmet. So, does the referee go over and take the helmet off? No, he doesn't. No. Does Madison go over and take the helmet off to go, see? No. It's not Velvet or Lacey. Madison did not offer this evidence. No. Madison is pitching a fit about how mad she was that this happened. But then, she walks over to the motorcycle girl. They both get on the motorcycle together. And off they go. This girl who just cost her the title and refused to reveal evidence. We had a DQ based on absolutely no evidence whatsoever, which pissed off the champion, who then made up with the person who cost her the title, and they left together on a motorcycle. I only gave this minus one star. And upon further thought, perhaps minus three? Honestly, this is the point. I was doing star ratings up until this match, and then I just gave up. I, I, all I know is I, I did not watch Lost. Perhaps there was a storyline involving a motorcycle they had to use. I don't know. I just remember <laughs> when I wrote was Death of WCW. And offensive. Was there was there anything in Death of WCW that I wrote about that was this stupid? <laughs> I mean, this is really dumb. So then we add AJ. I mean, let's just think about this for a second. Let's say that Velvet or Lacey was under the helmet. Okay. Who cares? Unmask them. You lost the title anyway. Now, if they weren't, then <laughs> unmask. Why didn't you take the helmet off and get your fucking belt back? <laughs> This was dumb. So then we had AJ and Kazarian against Rob Terry and Samoa Joe. Yes, when we were trying to think of mystery partners, I thought, Joe's not on this show. He'd be a great partner. I wonder who he'll team with. Rob Terry. Rob was not a great partner. 
Yeah. Fans agreed. Yeah. As Joe started, he was wrestling, it was fun, and he tagged out to Big Rob, and the fans went, boo! Mm-hmm. So, they had a match. It was mostly good because it was mostly Joe in the ring, except that means they also had to get the heat on Joe, who then had to make a hot tag to Rob Terry, and the crowd didn't like him. Yeah. So, he broke down into a four-way. Desmond hit the ring. Oh, yes. Third straight match with bullshit. He attacked him at ringside, right in front of the ref. It was not a DQ. Heels double-teamed Terry, hit him with a bunch of moves, and then they pinned him. And AJ and Kazarian, the storyline is they're, they hate each other, but they're both trying to get on Flair's good side. Even though they hate each other, they were so happy to win that they began jumping up and down and, and grab-assing. And then they realized what they were doing, and so they had to act calm and cool again. And then after they left, Joe beat up Desmond and killed him with the muscle buster. Mm-hmm. Sucks bad to be Desmond Wolf. Max was there, two and a quarter maybe, I don't know. Then we had Abyss, I give it two and a half. Abyss ranting and raving to Christy, the highlight of which was when he said that they were taking over and they had shown him how to use the board with nails in it. Or had they? Because apparently you have to take classes. (laughs) It's a technique. To learn how to handle a board with nails in it. But they have taught Abyss how to do this. Matt Morgan Hernandez in a cage match. I gave this a star and three quarter. I know that Bruce Mitchell of the Torch said this was the worst match of the year. What? I would not go that far. I particularly, the show. <laughs> I was going to say, particularly giving, did you not see the women's match? That was horrible. <laughs> now, granted, this match was no good. And Matt Morgan now, it's, I don't know how many years it's been. Next time Cornette's on the show, I'm going to have to ask him about Morgan. What did you see in him? He predicted Morgan would be a WrestleMania main eventer. I don't know what went wrong. He's still clumsy. He's the same Matt Morgan we saw six years ago in Ohio Valley. He's a female version of Daphne. God bless the guy. He's a female version of Daphne? <laughs> Male version of Daphne. Anyway, they had a match. It was pretty bad. The big high spot was Hernandez doing the same splash that he did off the cage at Triple Mania, except this time Morgan moved and he crashed and burned. Morgan handcuffed him to the ropes. You know the gimmick. He tried to climb, but Hernandez broke the cuffs and then dove through the door, breaking it asunder and landing on the ramp to win. They worked hard. Morgan is tall. So I gave it a start in three quarters. The, the first half of it, I actually was surprised how good it was. It, just, it was a very basic match, but it just felt like every time Hernandez needed to make a comeback, he did. And every time it was time for him to get, for him to get cut off, he did. So it was just paced very well. It all made sense, and things were going fine. And then, at one point, Morgan had the heat, and he walked over and had the door open, and he put, had one foot on the mat and put one foot on the ramp and stopped went back in. So he had Hernandez totally beaten. So they've established that Hernandez is a geek. Well, they do this in all these matches. Well, they do, but yes. And then, then came all the stupidity of the Miss Splash. We had Hernandez trying to get Morgan up for a powerbomb multiple times and failing. And uh, then after all this, there was also handcuffs. So as usual, a lot of stupidity, a lot of sloppiness, a lot of too much going on. I liked the first half, didn't like the second half. So probably, yeah, averages out to about a star and a half or so. By the way, I'll talk about this with Steve Sims, and there's a review in the newsletter this week, but I watched the entire Triple Mania card. That was a really good show. And the L.A. park La Parca match, I thought it was a four-and-a-quarter star match, and the invasion at the end was so much better than the NXT invasion. Oh, come on now. And I remember watching and thinking, TNA's show tomorrow looks like it's got a good card on paper. I wonder if it's going to be better than Triple Mania. It wasn't. Duly noted. Flair did an interview about Jay Lethal. And basically talked about how he was the man. He was going to style and profile. He hated to show off, but tonight he was going to. Said it was a Sunday night. He should be in a hotel room drinking red wine and fucking some girl. But instead, he had to go out there tonight in Orlando and sweat. And that pissed him off. And he said that by the time he was done with Letha, Letha would go home and tell his mom he needed to suck on her breast to nurse himself back to health. Said he was the best of all time. And he was during this promo. Well, he was. He was this is not as great as the Impact promo he just cut, but it no. was great. And then they cut to the announce desk where Taz and Mike's nay yammered for several minutes yeah. about nothing. I don't know what happened here, but it sucked. Eventually, we got Ric Flair versus Jay Lethal. This, by the way, was where the show turned around. Flair and Lethal, I gave it three stars. Ric Flair is 61 years old. He did every trick in the yes. book. They had a Ric Flair match. If you're one of those people that says all Ric Flair matches are the same and he's overrated, then you probably gave this minus five stars. But if you're one of those people that can appreciate fun pro wrestling, this was a three-star match. Flair did all of his moves, the flop, the eye pokes, 
the spot where he gets caught coming off the top. His ass came out. Ass, ass hanging out. At 61. Shoving the ref, the whole nine yards. And finally, Lethal gave him a Vader bomb in the legs, put him in the figure four, and Ric Flair tapped out. Yes. And Flair screamed at Hebner. Hebner shoved him. Flair took a bump. Lethal looked like he was about to cry. Not a match of the year. Nothing like that. But this was probably as good a match as a human being can have at 61 years old. Yes, it was. And also, to this point, on this pay-per-view encounter, far and away the best match on the show. Yes, this was the best match on the show up to this point. If, that, if this would have been the main event, Flair would have stole the show. If they would have just ended right here. Yeah. But they didn't. Well, that's actually a good thing because the next match was better. Machine Guns and Beer Money for the vacant TNA Tag Titles, four-star match. They had a hell of a match, as you'd expect. The, per- the crowd had a hard time getting into it early because they were so into the flare match. But by the end, they were going nuts. They did a deal where one of the refs took a bump, and it was Brian Hebner. And then Earl Hebner w- ran in to take over for him. And they did a bunch of near falls, and finally they did a double pin with each referee counting the pin. So it was like, we fucked you. It's a draw. You have to pay for the next show. But no, Earl Hebner ruled, this match must continue. So the match continued. The babyface did a bunch of spots. They got the pin clean. They won the championships for the first time. The place went nuts. Four stars. Nothing. Nothing to hate about this match. No, no. They, Even they, the referee they, stuff was... It, uh, it made sense in the end. Yes. Yeah, so you it, you it was, see all of these stupid TNA matches with referee bullshit. In fact, there were other ones on this year's show. This was a great example of doing shit with referees, and it was all fine. It was all great. Because it, made, it, it teased you to think you would not get what you wanted, which made you want to get it more, and you got it a minute later, and you were happier. Yes. This was, it was at first, a very old-school tag match where they got the heat on uh, Saban, I think, and then, no, he on Shelly, hot tag Saban, and he ran well for a while, then the guns did a bunch of double teams, and then they got cut off, and it felt like one of those old ROH Briscoe's matches where it just goes way too long, and it gets worse and worse each minute, and then suddenly they just started doing more near falls, and uh, it got hotter and hotter, and then they did a big train wreck spot with a bunch of dives, and from then on, it was just great again. So, yes, uh, this, a raving thumbs up. It was uh, an utter success and the best match in the show. Then we had Angle and the Pope. I gave it three and a half stars. It was a really good match. thing was, the fans, after the last two matches, had an even harder time getting into this one. And I realize this is somewhat of a, a, a knock, but not really. Everything we said about Ric Flair in the match with Jay Lethal doing a Ric Flair match, Kurt Angle now has a match. It is not a matter of Kurt Angle is wrestling the Pope, no. RVD, Mr. Anderson, Jeff Hardy, Jay Lethal. Well, maybe Matt Morgan would be different. AJ Styles, he's always going to have the same match. They're going to do some Matt wrestling early. He's going to get the heat. He's going to do a bunch of suplexes, or they're going to get the heat on him. He's going to make a comeback. He's going to do a bunch of Germans. They're going to trade submissions, trade ankle locks, and finally he's going to tap him out. That's exactly what this was. Yes. There's nothing wrong with it, but... It did not matter if the Pope was in there. It doesn't matter who was in there. It's the exact same match he always has. Three and a half stars, though. For, I mean, it was a three and a half star Kurt Angle match. Yeah. There you go. The, the, the two things hurting it were, A, uh, they tried to have a Ring of Honor style athlete versus athlete match in front of a crowd that wanted to cheer one person and boo the other. And so there was one part where they were trading punches towards the end, and instead of going boo and yay, the crowd sat there in abject silence. And Not to mention, nobody believed Pope was winning. That this was match. the father number two. Everyone on Earth knew Kurt Angle was going to win. So, a very good match with very, very bad heat. And the the the, the, the uh, opening part with the mat wrestling was very good. The near falls at the end were good. The middle part was pretty boring because everyone knew it was going to happen. And it was just inevitable. RVD did a promo. He was asked what you do with a man who has a board filled with nails. And RVD very aggressively responded that you shove that nail-covered board up the man's ass. He said it as if he had done it before and looked forward to doing it again. Disconcerting. RVD, Mr. Anderson, Jeff Hardy, and Abyss. Close your eyes, if you didn't see this show. Imagine RVD, Mr. Anderson, Jeff Hardy, and Abyss having a eight-minute impact TV main event. There's your match. It's exactly what you expect. They did a stacked up stupid plex. That was like the big spot on the match. The highlight of that was Abyss was on the bottom of the pile, obviously, so he power bombs two dudes and they suplex the last guy. And then all four men are down. Why did that hurt Abyss? I don't know. <laughs> Why did that cause him pain? So they do this match and they're brawling and ends up with the finish was Abyss. Well, hold on. Okay. Okay, they, they, they did the superplex, which, which somehow killed Abyss. And Jeff 
then hit Anderson with a senton. He killed him. And a bitch grabbed Jeff and choke slammed him onto Anderson. Killing him again. RVD did a frog splash onto the pile. RVD covered Anderson. One, two, three. That's essentially what it felt like watching it as well. There was a three count, and at first I thought, oh, elimination match. And then they said RVD retain, and it yeah. was like, yes. what? That, that is exactly how it felt. Like, at best, the first fall of a multi-fall encounter. No, it was the finish to the main event of the pay-per-view. There's, I mean, there were still 20 minutes left of pay-per-view time, and usually they go to, like, five or ten minutes to the top of the hour. They, I mean, I guess maybe the idea was that we were all supposed to really get into a brawl that Hardy and Anderson had right before this happened, but nobody did. No. Nobody was into this match Probably at because all. it sucked. The thing was, there was no reason to care about this match. The belt no. means nothing. Yeah. Nobody cares about whether Anderson and Hardy are friends or not. No. No one cares about Abyss in a straight wrestling match. No. RVD is just another guy. Uh-huh. And then when it was over, Abyss it went. It was just over. Abyss went and got his board, and he pointed at RVD, and nobody was into this at all because they know RVD is not about to get hit with a board filled with fucking nails. So RVD moves, Abyss slams the board into the canvas, nothing happens, so he does it again, and this yeah. time the canvas gets all ripped up, and then he goes, ah! And then the show went off the air. This was uh, lame. Yes. Lame finish. The show went just deep, deep off a cliff. It was, uh, yeah. It you know what this was? It was exactly like Impact, where you had that awesome deal with Flair, Flair and Lethal, and then they had to follow it up with the angle to set up this four-way that nobody cared about, that brought the show way down, yes. and it's exactly what happened with the actual match itself. Yeah, I actually did give us a rating of a star and three-quarter. I gave it two. Yeah, so... This was his average two star, even even as a generous two star rating. That's still a horrible rating for a pay per view main event. Well, two stars is an average match. Which that is, is exactly what this was. Yeah, this was which an is, average match. A pay per view main event should be better than average. Well, it's true, but okay. this was an average match. Yes, you had an average match for the main event. What the hell can you do? To the back. So Impact Suck to Cock is noted this was a show where they tried to prove that we can put a bunch of great wrestling on TV and still have a sack of shit show, which is what this was. It opened up with the top ten rankings. I need Todd Martin here on the show to defend the rankings here. In order, from ten down to one, we had Rob Terry, the global champion, the Pope, Kurt Angle, Hernandez, AJ Styles, Jay Lethal, Samoa Joe, Mr. Anderson, Jeff Hardy, and Abyss. Now, I could have sworn the Pope lost the pay-per-view. Somehow he lost the pay-per-view and vaulted over Rob Terry, who was the global champion. The global champion is, the championship is so prestigious that the champion is ranked number 10. That means nine men are considered more valuable than the global champion. Ten men, because he's also the champion. That's true. Yeah. Ten men in TNA are more valuable than your global champion. I will, Hernandez somehow ended up in front of Kurt Angle. How? I have absolutely no idea. Well, I I, I pay so little attention to these that when Hernandez was in front of Angle, I didn't particularly take notice of it. Until later in the show... We'll get to that. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that. Mike may have pointed it out, but yes. All I know is that when I saw Hernandez ranked where he was, I knew that that meant the next... Fucking Kurt Angle pay-per-view match is Kurt Angle versus Hernandez? You've yeah. got to be kidding me. Yes. Well, oh, you're mostly right. It was worse. Yes. It gets worse, everyone. I just noted here that the there were four men in the championship four-way match we saw on Sunday. Three of them, by rule of the match, lost. Those three men are still one, two, and three. Of course. And why not? And why not? Why not? Out came Abyss. He did a promo, said they had a plan for him and his girl. His girl is the board with nails in it. He also had a side of beef with him, yeah. and he said he was going to share his plan with RVD later. In the meantime, he was going to introduce him to the fucking board, whose name is Janice, and he then proceeded to beat his meat. Get it? He beat his meat. Ha-ha! <laughs> 2010. He also ate his meat. He beat the was... meat so hard that he broke Janice. Oh. That fucking sucks. Yeah, so he... uh it was funny because I was noticing that I, I noticed he's actually losing weight. And then he began to dine on raw meat here in the ring. So no there, there's a secret, everyone. Eat nothing but raw meat. Cut backstage, and Taylor Wilde was beating on Serena, uh, Serena again. I must cut you off. There were two women brought him backstage. Yeah. One was a blonde. One was a brunette. Tanae immediately says, "Hey, look, Serena and, and Taylor Wilde." Mm-hmm. Okay. 
They were just randomly attacking each other. There was no security to be found. They fought forever, as in approximately three minutes. Most TNA matches don't go as long as this brawl. So they're brawling and brawling and brawling backstage. Nobody is breaking it up. And how does this brawl go to commercial? Why, Serena puts her in a hold. A hold in a brawl. Yes. So they're Mike in a... Mike Tanay was so concerned about this backstage brawl that so may get hurt in this dangerous out-of-control environment that he took the opportunity to plug their match. Yeah, he goes, if you think this is nuts, wait until you see their street fight, which is next. So the street fight came. It was no more nuts than the brawl backstage. In fact, it was the exact same thing just at ringside. They brawled for about an hour. Taz said, we can only assume that Sarita started this. And I thought, why in the fuck would we assume anything about this? Not a single reason I would assume that either girl started this. So Taylor hit her with a chair, which at least Sarita blocked. Then Sarita hit her with water, which Taylor actually sold more than Sarita had sold the chair shot. They brawled and brawled and brawled. Most Taylor matches threw a drop kick on the floor. Most so matches on this show with great workers get three minutes. These girls got about seven. It was nothing but brawling. And finally, Sarita choked her out with a belt and won. This was not awful, but there was like literally absolutely no reason to care about it, and it dragged on forever. Correct. Yes, it was a, a waste of television time. Speaking of which, we then had a Rob Van Dam promo. He was walking backstage, said he was not scared of Abyss, and challenged him to use his thing tonight. Brooke, I can't even call her Brooke's ass anymore. It's Brooke's no ass. Was on the phone. Yeah, this is this is how stupid TNA is, everyone. As Brian's noted, they don't show her ass at all, but they do have her talk. Of course. Think about how many promos she cut in, in ECW. I really believe the answer is zero. Yeah. They just had her dance and show her ass a lot because they have a clue. Yeah. TNA hides her ass, has her turn, turn facing the camera, and then has her speak words. Yeah. Poor idea. Poor, poor idea. She was yelling at someone on the phone. Kevin Nash walked in. He wanted to fuck, but then he changed his mind and left. But then he changed his mind again and came back in and said he didn't want to fuck after all. And there's more to come. He wanted an appointment with Hulk, but Hulk no-showed this show. As part of the storyline, everyone, Hulk and Bischoff no-showed impact. Kendrick and Williams in a non-title I quit match. In so, other words, the champion can quit, and he will remain champion. They said that Williams had agreed to the match but refused to put the title on the line, which begs the question, why would he ever put it on the line? If all he has to do is say, no, I'm not no. putting it on the line, why would you ever say yes? I don't know. I just like the idea here. At the pay-per-view, Brian Kendrick lost clean as a sheet via submission. Huh? So his reward or penalty, however you want to look at it, is that he gets another match with the champion in the same stiffs that he already lost to. They weren't the same. There was no X above the ring. It, 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 they were in the same stiffs in the manner the finish was decided. So he could theoretically quit again. It makes no sense, is my point. I like this match actually better than a pay-per-view match because it didn't have the fucking idiotic stipulations. And ended up with Kendrick winning. He tapped out the champion with a Cobra Clutch after Douglas missed a charge into the buckle, at which point, 1996 all over again, out came Kevin Nash. He demanded a mic. Kendrick told him to get out of the ring, so Nash calmly put the mic down, grabbed Kendrick by the neck, choke slammed him like the biggest geek. Mm -hmm. Brian Kendrick said, and I quote, Kendrick was like an annoyance to Nash. <laughs> yeah, you know, he sure was. He was. You're correct, Taz. Brian Kendrick, Douglas Williams, and the X Division title, and the X Division all rendered moot. So Nash said he was sick of Hogan and Bischoff dodging him. It was bullshit he couldn't get on TV. He said when he died, he would never be replaced. That's for sure. said he was 6'10", built like a god, which Brooks No Ass was going to find out about in a minute. He was a living legend, blah, blah, blah. He said if he couldn't get their attention, he was going to continue taking out their, quote, young boys until he started paying attention. So who should come out to defend the young boys in 2010 but Jeff Jarrett? And they had an argument back and forth. Jeff mentioned it's not about us anymore. It's about these great young talents like Jay Lethal. Keep that in mind, by the way. And he said Nash was nothing but a glory hound and an egotistical son of a bitch. That was a news flash in 1999. So Nash wanted to know why Jarrett was sticking up for Hogan and Bischoff. And he said uh, we were going to find out soon who the best worker was. 
And he said, if you want trouble with me, I guess you've got it. And uh, this was a segment that no man on the earth could possibly care about. And no women watch TNA, so it was a mega fail. It was a complete fail. After commercial, there was one of those Nash talking to someone just off camera promos. He repeated that he didn't know why Jarrett would defend Hogan and Bischoff. Then said he would have all the answers by 10 when he was going to fuck Brooke. Yeah, he said he was going to have all the answers by 10 p.m., he said. Write that down as well. And we never found out what happened. Rob Terry, Joe, and Desmond in another non-title match. Joe and Desmond are both ranked higher than Rob Terry, yet they still are unable to get a championship match. What? I don't know. What, what do you have to do to deserve a match if the champion is ranked 10 and you're like 6 and 7? I mean, what do you have to do? And you're, you're already ranked higher than that person. Right. Shouldn't the title matches be automatic for everyone ranked above the global champion? You're, you're... Yes, I am thinking about this. Yes. Because, Stop. you know, you want to know why? Because that's what people do. <laughs> you can't help it. Because, because people actually do think. I know that this is a revelation to TNA, that their fans actually have brains. Well, I, mm. But fans actually do watch this show, and they ask questions. And, of course, they never get answers, and that's why people don't watch this show. That's why nobody watches TNA and nobody buys the pay-per-views. They have this match. Joe tapped out Desmond, and uh, the crowd liked it. patted um, Terry on the back. And then he walked away. I don't know. Magnus was on commentary. I literally, literally remember nothing he said. Mm-hmm. I have no idea what his point was. Machine Guns against Beer Money. They're doing a best of five series, everyone. Match number one was a ladder match. I can only presume that match number two will be a cage match. No, they, they, match they, number three will be a street fight. Match number four will be a straight match. And match number five will be a verbal debate. By the end of the show, they actually did reveal the steps for pick match number two. It was going to be a street fight. Yeah, because, you see, they had this ladder match, and the there was a contract hanging above the ring, and the winning team won the first match in the best of five series, and they also won the contract and the right to choose a stipulation for match two. Now, it's impossible for Beer Money and Motor City Machine Guns to have a bad match. Now, obviously, the first question is, why don't you do best of three with one match on the next three pay-per-views? Because it's TNA. That was a rhetorical question. So, of course, in this ladder match, we have a ref bump. Now, there's two referees at ringside. Why? Well, if one goes down, there's another one. Of course, two referees are Brian Hebner and Earl Hebner. So, of course, when Brian Hebner goes down, Earl Hebner leaves his post and goes over to tent to Brian Hebner. Because you see, the referees in TNA are fucking goddamn incompetent. So now there's no refs. The uh, machine guns win when uh, Saban climbs up and gets the contract. But then Storm hits him in the back with a beer bottle. The contract falls to the mat. James Storm grabs it. Earl Hebner comes in the ring. We got a fucking ref bump and a screw job in a ladder match <laughs> that aired on free television. In you know, a non-title ladder match. Yes. To this point in the show, we have seen a street fight, a non-title I quit match, a non-title freeway, and now a non-title ladder match. And also, and this is like the third time I pointed out on the show alone, when you lose a title match in the pay-per-view, you just wrestle the champion again. Yeah. You don't have to beat D1 to get a second chance. You just stay at the same level you're at. Then we had a segment that... Is this the girls? No. We had Pope versus Matt Morgan. Now, first off, I saw Pope and Matt Morgan in the ring, and I thought, what is this match? Why is this match being made? <laughs> it was even more retarded because Matt Morgan is just in the ring. He didn't even get an entrance. So I thought, hmm, sucks to be Matt Morgan. I wonder who he pissed off. So Matt Morgan and the Pope have a match. The match goes approximately, I wrote, Pope wins in a minute. It may have been about a minute. The Pope beats Matt Morgan clean as a sheet in one minute with a code breaker. My immediate thought, well, Matt Morgan must be in the doghouse. What a jobber he turned out to be. So Pope beats Matt Morgan in one minute with the code breaker, and Matt Morgan proceeds to attack the Pope afterwards. He beats him up, 
he gives him the carbon footprint and lays him out. So the Pope made Matt Morgan look like a jobber, and then the jobber proceeded to beat up the Pope. Yes. So then Mr. Anderson comes down to the ring with a chair to protect the Pope, who's being beaten up by the jobber, and he throws the Pope into the ring, he goes into the ring, and he teases that he's going to beat him up. He invites Matt Morgan in the ring to help him beat up the Pope. But, of course, it's a swerve, and he beats up Matt Morgan, who was so stupid that he fell for this trick. So, in this segment, they made the Pope and Matt Morgan look like complete idiots, and we had a pointless swerve for absolutely no reason at all. These writers don't understand the first thing about professional wrestling. It's astounding. It is completely astounding. And Somebody took a piece of paper and they wrote, Pope beats Matt Morgan one minute. Matt Morgan then beats up Pope. How can you do that? Well, Brian. How can you do that? As we have seen ample evidence of, these people don't know what they're doing. They don't know what makes good TV. They don't know what makes good pro wrestling. They don't know anything. I don't know what they know. Fucking idiots. Lacey and Velvet were bitching at each other backstage. I do know this. I do know that the Pope Morgan Anderson segment was much better than this segment here with the girls. Lacey and Velvet bitching. Velvet pissed off about Madison being all high and mighty. Madison goes to the ring to protest the finish from the pay-per-view. Said she was only supposed to uh, lose the belt if Velvet or Lacey interfered. That didn't happen. She's going to file a lawsuit. Sue TNA for every penny it's worth. I cackled. That would I be nothing. How old with laughter. Lacey and Velvet came out. They proceeded to bitch and bitch and bitch and bitch. And then out came Angelina, and she bitched and bitched and bitched. And Velvet and Lacey bitched and bitched, and then Velvet walked out. And then Angelina got in the ring and attacked Madison, and the biker girl came out. There was absolutely no heat for any of this. Nobody cared at all. The biker chick helped Madison lay out Angelina. Madison left with the biker chick. This was horrendous. I'm going to read a passage of my notes here. Velvet and Lacey come out. They talk about dumb blonde pills. This is some god-awful, miserable, unbearable television. Angelina comes out and bitches about bitches. Says it was Velvet on the bike. She could tell by the fake boobs. Velvet says her ass is too nice. She leaves. So Angelina goes to fight Madison. This is the worst segment of the year on any show. They brawl. They are dressed exactly the same. Ghost Rider shows up. Lacey is still there. Now, if you think we're being sexist with all this talk about boobs and ass and bitches, that's the words they used. Yeah. I'm just quoting them. Yeah. Don't get mad at me. Yeah. Because the people that write this hate women. Yeah. Patently obvious. It's also clear they hate me. <laughs> Jay Lethal and Jeff Hardy... By the way, this Jeff Hardy match took place at 1040, which means it was 40 minutes after when Kevin Nash was supposed to know the answer to all these questions, and we never got an update. Maybe it turns out he is a 60-minute man. Jay was wearing red and yellow. They said it was a tribute to Hogan for putting him in the match with Flair. Today talked about how next week, in addition to match two of the best of five, which is a non-title street fight, it is also going to be Kurt Angle putting his career on the line against Hernandez. Yeah. Yeah. They announced this. During a Jeff Hardy vs. J. Lethal match with no graphic, and then never spoke of it again. This, as stupid as that was, was immediately followed by Jeff Hardy pinning J. Lethal clean with a senton. Right. The same J. Lethal that earlier in the show yeah. Jeff Hardy put over as the poster boy of the young guys in TNA. Yes, after they spent the entire show talking about how his win over Ric Flair was the greatest day of his life. The city he remembered three days, one of which, by the way, was the day he was born. He doesn't really? remember that day. Apparently, That's a lie. That would be very impressive. Probably rather stressful as well. But yes, and then, then he said they remember the day he beat Ric Flair, and then the next show he lost in three minutes clean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Hey, it's not my show. I just have to watch it. Then we had Flair come out for his big announcement. <laughs> this was just amazing. Okay. Rick goddamn Flair is in the ring. With AJ and Kazarian, who now are best buds. Yes, they hated each other last week. 
They got together at the pay-per-view, but then had to act like they weren't gla- grab-assing. Now they're best friends. Mm-hmm. Flair inducts them into the Fortune Group, and out comes Nigel McGuinness. And Nigel McGuinness wants to be in Fortune. And <laughs> he comes out and he says, after Victory Road, if anyone deserves to be in Fortune, it's me. What about one hour ago when you were the one who tapped out in a match to Samoa Joe? It was all taped out of order. What am I missing here? Don't know. So so AJ and Kazarian decided to leave. Yeah. Then Flair called them back. Then Desmond began to threaten Flair, and then Abyss came out. Now, <laughs> we have been talking about it for a minute, maybe more. So help me God, on television... It all took place in 20 seconds. Yes. It raced by. And then they I just was disappeared. Furious. They disappeared. Too much stuff going on. So, Abyss came out. Everyone else disappeared. Abyss called out Rob Van Dam. Rob came out. Mm-hmm. They had a verbal debate. Rob, Abyss said they have taken over. He said they instructed him to take the title from Rob. He challenged Rob to a Janice on a pole match. It's not the words they used. But it's what he said. The TLS match. Tables, ladders, and shit. <laughs> and the stick. So then Rob hit him. They had a fight. Then Mick Foley came out. Then the four ECW guys we have seen, Tommy Dreamer, Raven, Stevie Richards, and Rhino, called by those names, by the way, hit the ring. They beat up Abyss. They beat up security geeks. Then they beat up wrestling geeks like... Kiyoshi. Kiyoshi. Phi Delta Slam. <laughs> Yeah, still around. They beat them up, beat up some refs. Then they beat up agents like Terry Taylor and Pat Kenny. No, D'Lo Brown. I'm sorry, D'Lo Brown. Al yeah. Snow and Pat Kenny are well, Team ECW. Okay. Yes, we we were told during this brawl that Kenny and Snow and, in fact, Rob Van Dam himself had joined ECW. The problem is the environment was, for all intents and purposes, a battle royal, and you couldn't tell. It was just bodies flying all over. Mm-hmm. You couldn't tell who was turning on who and who... Was siding with what? And and you couldn't care. Yeah. So, Lethal came out. Desmond Wolf was there. Hernandez and Morgan came out almost side by side after their months long war. Why on earth would Matt Morgan care about this? I don't have an answer. Why for would Matt Morgan care about Tommy Dreamer being up abyss? You know what I loved about this is, <laughs> of course, there's like five. There's maybe wait six ECW guys. There's the guys that came out, and then there's there's uh, Simon Diamond and Al Snow. Al Snow. So it's six against the roster. And, of course, fans start chanting ECW. Yeah. Now, this is, again, a rhetorical question, because the answer is, of course they don't fucking have a clue. But does anyone remember the damage that the NWO ultimately did to WCW? Ric Flair does. People remember... Ric Flair says it's their fault it's dead. People remember the 1996, 1997 and this great NWO invasion angle, they don't seem to recall the fact that the WCW guys never got their revenge. The NWO beat them and beat them and beat them and made fun of them and called them lame and stupid until ultimately the fans decided that WCW was lame and stupid. So here we are, the ECW guys getting cheered, people chanting ECW here in this thing, because, of course, people think ECW is cooler than TNA. Well, they're right. So unquestionably right. They're having this brawl, which really isn't all that great a brawl. Tommy Dreamer hurt himself, which is what happens when you use old fuckers in your invasion angle, and they're fighting and this and that. And finally, Dixie Carter intervenes, and she says, "Stop it! Stop it! Listen to me! Stop! Listen!" By the way, I'm showing more charisma here than she did. I invited them, she said. At which point, Al Snow, of all people, looked shocked. Why would Al Snow be shocked? Apparently, he was not spartaned up by his friends to how their invasion worked. So Dixie Carter is explaining that I invited them. That's when they go off the air with the cliffhanger. This ECW invasion, the centerpiece of it was Dixie Carter. Now stop for a second and listen to me. Does anybody remember the time ECW invaded WWE during the 
the famous WCW invasion? Oh, I do. Yeah. And do you remember who was in charge of ECW and Storyline? I could swear it was one Stephanie McMahon. And do you remember what an epic fail that was? I do. And is there any shock to you whatsoever that Dixie Carter is the centerpiece of this goddamn angle? Again, you see, TNA takes every bad idea that there's ever been in this business, and they recreate it. I've got a great idea. Let's center the ECW invasion around Dixie Carter. Hey, we can't get Paul Heyman. So the next best thing, Dixie Carter. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the crowd, by the way, was chanting Paulie's name throughout this angle. <laughs> He's not there. I would be... I'd be pretty stunned if he ever came. Oh, God. If he saw this... Yeah. If he saw this, everyone, he ain't fucking coming in. No way. No, seriously. You think Paul Heyman watched this and was like, boy, I got to get a, I gotta attach my name to this. I've got to get in here. This I've, is a shooting star. I got to jump on board. This, this, they've laid the groundwork for, for success here. <laughs> Dixie fucking Carter has invited the ECW guys. She is the centerpiece of this angle. Oh, my God, this show was shit. I hate wrestling. This show was this show, shit. This show was complete complete ass. <laughs> they, wrote, they wrote this and thought this would be cool. <laughs> Dixie Carter invited ECW. What a great idea. This show didn't suck because of random, you know. Someone, it didn't suck because somebody got hurt and wasn't, it, was, it wasn't their fault or some guys just had a bad match. No. Everything on the show went like they wanted it to. Even Dead Sea Drop hated this show. For those of you that have been on the board... He posted a thread that just said, fuck TNA. And that was, the, that was the title of the thread. And his first post read, that is all. God, what a wretched show. This was the big the big angle. They ain't making it the year. Good. Mark my words. TNA dead by the end of this year. I realize I said that eight years ago. <laughs> Maybe they'll sell to someone even dumber. But this, this place dead by the end of the year. This was their big ECW angle. Yeah, this was the big angle. Don't watch Impact, everyone. And then next week, Dixie gives the big speech in the middle of the ring about how she invited these guys. We're going to give them one more chance at glory. Tommy Dreamer fucking cries. Yes, everyone. Tommy Dreamer will cry next week. Yeah. You must tune in as you have before. Oh, yeah. All those millions of other times he has shed tears in a wrestling ring. My God, is this going to turn to bit? My God, Brian, this is going to turn the fucking business around. Shit. I can't wait to get drunk. To the back! Impact opened with... What the hell happened to the show? If I started at the top of my notes, that would help. Impact opened with Rob Terry versus AJ Styles. You recall last week, Rob Terry was in a three-way with Samoa Joe and Desmond Wolf. It was not a title match, even though they're all ranked above him in the top ten. This week, he wrestled AJ Styles, who was also above him, and it was a title match. Why? Apparently because AJ pinned him in a tag match in the pay-per-view. Hmm. So what we got here was Ric Flair versus an even shittier Lex Luger. It was not terrible, but it was, you know, it was the AJ Styles show doing what he could with a large and mobile man. Rob Terry had the match won with a spin kick, of all things. Kaz had the refs distracted, so then uh, Rob went to suplex AJ in, but Kaz tripped him and then held his leg down for the finish. So AJ Styles needed help to beat Rob Terry. He is a new champ. And Mike Tanay then said the following words. This is absolutely ridiculous to have a title change like that. She said. TNA, everyone. Uh, and my ex- the first thing I thought of was this is the company that has people lose titles in boxes. And then I was reminded in the next segment, this is the company that has people lose titles because of anonymous interference. AJ sold his entire match until the finish. So he looked like an idiot and won via screw job. Yeah. In a two-minute title match. AJ Styles, is, he's now the honky-tonk man. This is stupid. Yeah. And Kazarian and AJ, for absolutely no good reason, are best friends now. Yeah. Because they, they got one they win, got on one win together. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, yes, this is absolutely ridiculous to have a title change like that. I agree with Mike's name. <laughs> and Serena and Madison and Velvet and Lee, Lacey all bitched each other Actually, you're missing the, the line from today when he said, Tonight's show, we promise answers. Laughable. Hmm. I did not know that line, and I'm happy I did not know that line. So, yes, we had Sarita and Madison and Lacey and Velvet bitching at each other backstage. The only positive here was Madison's flesh tone sports bra. I approve of this. Everything else about it sucked. They've killed the most entertaining group in this company. That was actually rendered, uh, very clear in their match. 
We had a clip of Dixie laying down the law to her agents. There was Al Snow and Pat Kenny and D'Lo Brown and Terry Taylor. Let me talk about this segment. All right. I know these guys are agents because I'm me. How the fuck is any casual fan supposed to know who these people are? I assume just because she said you are agents. Dixie was yelling at the agents backstage. Somebody actually wrote this as a segment on this fucking television show. Yeah. And then she actually had a line where she told Al Snow, it's not your job to know what's going on. Well, that fucking explains everything. That explains everything here. <laughs> now you know why these pay-per-views, there's such stupid match booking in these pay-per-views. Because the agents aren't paid to know what they're doing. This was stupid. Speaking of stupid, we had Angelina and Taylor versus Sarita and Madison. Before the match, Dave Hebner cut a promo, or Earl Hebner cut a promo, whichever, said they could not prove the identity of the person who interfered at the pay-per-view. Therefore, Angelina had to hand the title back over to Madison Rain. It took them a week and a half to come to this conclusion. I was hoping I had some things in here that I could put in my mouth so I could recreate this promo that <laughs> there's Earl a reason, Hebner did. There's a reason this man has spoken like three times in his entire career. It was like Earl Hebner had all of his teeth knocked out, and they were all in his mouth, and he was bleeding heavily, and he had to cut this promo. Yes. So it took them ten days to reach this conclusion, and then they decided not to return the belt until right before the tag match. So they had a tag match. It sucked. It sucked bad. Uh, Angelina pinned Madison, for those of you who care. And then the girl on the motorcycle came out, and uh, Madison and Sarita and Lacey all left with her, and Angelina and Velvet looked at each other. I have no idea who any of these are baby faces and heels. I have no idea. All, all six of them, I believe. However many were out there, I have no, no idea who any of them are the good guys or bad guys. Not the first clue. Yeah, it about sucked. The crowd didn't care about it at all. I mean, deathly silence as this whole thing was going on. It was deathly silence during the, the match. It was deathly silence afterwards when they were doing all their goofy mic work. It's just a stupidly overcomplicated, goofy angle. Welcome to TNA. Yeah, the latest. The We had clips of the ECW guys walking into the building. They walked into the building in the most boring manner possible. And we saw them walk around a bit, and that was that. Kurt Angle versus Hernandez with Kurt Angle's career on the line, not only on free TV with one week's build, not even the main event of the show. They had a pretty good match for the five minutes or so it lasted. They had a great match. Yeah. I I do wish Kurt Angle would stop missing moonsaults and completely meaningless shit like this. Or really all matches in general, but especially for this. And and, uh, he won clean with the ankle lock. So, Kurt Angle can have a good match with any human being, I've now decided. And I thought this was a shockingly good match. Probably the best match Hernandez has had, maybe ever, actually. That's at least in TNA. Yeah. And yes, every time there was a near fall, Mike Tanay would bring up that this could potentially be the end of Kurt Angle's career. Retarded. Yes. Yes, it is. Speaking of retarded, Kevin Nash lumbered out. He called this up. fucking second. Okay. I don't even want to talk about this. All I know is they talked for like five minutes, and if they had been speaking Mandarin Chinese, I would have no worse an idea of what they were talking about. Not one word of this made a lick of sense to me. I have absolutely no, absolutely no idea what they were talking about. Not a goddamn word. I didn't understand a thing they were talking about here. None of this made any sense. I I have this. I guess Jeff Jarrett and Kevin Nash are going to have a feud. Sting was brought up. Hogan, Hall, Waltman, Bischoff were brought up. Apparently, the the children of Jeff Jarrett were brought up. Yeah. Nash thinks Jarrett is a selfish prick. (laughs) He told him to juggle that in your sleep. I guess, like, his balls? I don't know. I I fucking don't know. (laughs) And I'm going to move on now. To explain this segment, congratulations. Backstage, (sighs) Dixie Carter was pacing back and forth silently, and as she was doing this, we were told to follow her on Twitter. That made me laugh. So Kurt Angle walks up. Her top guy, just one, saved his career. He's going to continue wrestling for him. She responded by saying, great match. 
She should have gotten on her knees and in praise of this man for for still wrestling for him, for her. So he asked what was going on. She said, just said, I didn't work. Yeah, she said, I, I can't tell you. That was it. We had Jeff Hardy versus Samoa Joe. First part of this match, Eric Bischoff was on the phone explaining why he and Hulk Hogan were not there and had not been there for weeks, in fact. And one of his excuses was the 4th of July. That made me laugh. They get holidays off. So they had a really fun match. It was Joe beating up Jeff for probably eight and a half of the ten minutes. And then Jeff made his big comeback. And then the ten-minute time limit expired. I was fine with this. Let's look at Dixie's uh, Twitter here. Meanwhile... TNA uh, coming to uh, Dublin January 11th, 2011. Announcement coming tomorrow on the National Stadium Show. That was four hours ago. Then, also four hours ago, appreciate all your feedback on Hardcore Justice. For some reason, CORE was all capitalized. Tommy Dreamer and Friends are going to knock it out of the park for you. And then, three hours ago, it just says, Dublin show is January 24th, 2011. Sorry it's late and been a long day. Night, all. (laughs) Awesome. If you ain't following this... (laughs) How can you... If you're not following this, you don't know what you're missing. Yeah. I like Joe versus Hardy. It was... This was... I I have no complaints about that segment at all. Hell of a match. They had a very fun match, and then the, the... Draw will theoretically build to a rematch, so I was fine with this. Meanwhile, backstage, Dixie told Jeff the other guys were disappointed. He asked how he could help. She said she couldn't tell him now. This is bullshit. Anderson and Morgan had a boring match. The highlight of this was Anderson is still kicking his legs and stuff when guys are trying to lift him. I saw the same thing. Yes, yeah, Morgan it. tried to do a follow-away slam, yes. and Kennedy was legitimately struggling to make the move even harder to do, and, and Morgan, Morgan actually looked at him. Like, you fuck. Stop fucking moving, you dumbass. Yes. This sucked. So, yeah, then Anderson uh, hit the mic check out of nowhere and won, and so, of course, Morgan laid him out afterwards. Guy so, gets beat clean, lays out winner. So they both look like ten. And I, didn't they do this last week with Morgan and Pope? Did I imagine that? No, they did that same thing. All right. Not a single goddamn person on this show is over. No. So we had the Machine Guns versus Beer Money and Street Fight. I did laugh that the Machine Guns Street Fight gear is their regular gear with T-shirts on. But they had a good match, aside from the usual TNA director incompetence. And for the second straight week, there were not one but two ref bumps. And the Machine Guns had the match won, but James Storm hit, hit them with a beer bottle, and the and Beer Money got the uh, undeserved win for the second week in a row. Because you see, you have to have a ref bump in a street fight. Yes. Because God knows you can't use a beer bottle in a street fight. As you must have a ref bump in a ladder match. <laughs> it just must have fuck finishes. You know, I, I didn't buy, I didn't mind the ref bumps last week because they 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 did it in a creative manner, and and it all made sense in the end. This week, it annoyed me. They're going to do it again next week, but I'm sure at the end, the baby faces will win this time. But enough ref bumps, for God's sake. Just These guys let can them work. wrestle. Yes. <laughs> do ref bumps for Morgan and Anderson. Devon and Bubba had a meeting. Bubba was wearing an LAX t-shirt. He's supporting a tag team in TNA that no longer exists. Or maybe he just found it for free somewhere. So Devon announced that he had the back of the ECW guys. Bubba said he did not have those ba- their back. Said he had nothing left to prove to those guys. Had an RVD promo. Christy asked him what it was like fighting with the ECW guys again. He said it was awesome. Said he didn't know what the announcement would be. Said the hardcore fans have stuck with him. This is a nothing promo. He had nothing to say, really. It was a something promo. He had to have been stoned. It's <laughs> entirely possible. He was... Wacky. I don't know what else to say. He was just wacky. It's all goofy and smiling and saying stupid things and not taking anything seriously, and it was just bad. Kind of a typical RVD promo, then. Yeah. Yeah. So then we had the main event. Dixie came out. She had her own entrance video and theme song. Yeah, she's got her own entrance video and theme song, everyone. TNA president, it says. Mm-hmm. She talked about the fans, she plugged her Twitter and Facebook again, says she has learned... Thank God, <laughs> given the fascinating... Uh, the quality of her My fucking her Twitter's more exciting than that. She and announced, I've not seen it in two weeks. Okay, forget Twitter. The real highlight here is that she announced she had learned a lot through the years. Name one. Name one thing you've learned through the years. Nothing. 
So, well, she named what she did, in fact, name something she learned was that the fans still have love for hardcore wrestling. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. They don't. They don't. They really don't. So she brought out Dreamer and Raven and Stevie Richards and Rhino and Mick Foley. Foley in 2010 is still wearing leopard shirt, leopard print shirt with black sweatpants. Yeah. He said this was her first promo. Dixie then said that what Hulk Hogan was in the 1980s. He missed her saying no. This is not a promo. This is well, real. Me being real. Me being real. Yeah. yeah. All the other promos are fake. Yeah. This is real. A promo is something you say when you're fake. This is a real thing. So Dixie said that what Hulk Hogan was in the 1980s, ECW was in the 1990s. No. Fuck no. I think what she Shit said no. was what Hogan meant to the 80s, these men meant to ECW in the 90s. Not quite as bad. That is... That's a wretched comparison to make. I just like the uh, she her. Let me let me let me recap this. I don't know what show you were watching. So there was one common theme that had been brought up time and time again, which was quote your love for extreme hardcore wrestling. Now I know Abyss has done some barbed wire matches here and there, but I mean, really, is that the theme of TNA over the last eight years? The success has been based on extreme hardcore wrestling. She said that these men deserved respect, honor, said it's not about you doing this for fat paychecks. Because you see, Tina has no money. Yes. So Foley then cheerfully noted that the last time I was here four months ago, I was fired. And I'm glad you're giving me another chance. I may not have even been as chipper as Mick Foley. I don't Listen, I God bless Mick Foley. He came off so pathetic in this segment. So then Dreamer did a promo, and he cried. No. Yeah. He said he'd been watching TNA since the beginning in well, Nashville. That would make me cry as well. He'd watched them grow. His friends had told him to come to TNA, but he had a family he needed to support. Because you see, TNA has no money. Yes. This must be hammered into our heads today. He said a lot of he said a lot of, a lot of similarities between the old ECW and TNA. I see the similarity of they both lost a shitload of money. I see no others. He said before Samoa Joe there was Taz. He said before what Ric Flair did for Jay Lethal, Terry Funk had done for him. You know, beating the fuck out of him. Trying to kill brother. you. <laughs> Which I guess it's true, but he said Dixie invited him to Slam Anniversary and got to feel. TNA. He saw these people doing what they did for their love of the business and the fans, not for the money. Thank Dixie for bringing back that passion. He said in 2005, at ECW One Night Stand, he had his closure. I really did, he said. Write that down, by the way. So he said they brought it back, and he got to witness his friends get fired and destroyed. For what, he said. And some fan yelled, Vince sucks. And Dreamer said, exactly. He said he couldn't stomach it. And he finally had to quit his job at age 37. Now he's weeping profusely. He said Foley showed him all the similarities between ECW and TNA. And they put this plan together. And Dixie was the only one who could make it happen. Who's the only one that can make it happen? Dixie. Mm-hmm. Dixie Carter. Yeah. What the fuck kind of name is Dixie? If you're from Tennessee, apparently a great name. I don't want to get into... I'm not going to get into this. I'm just going to continue here. He said this wasn't about an ECW invasion. It was not about them taking over. It was about men and women who lost their jobs, whose lives were affected by it. It was so that their legacy would not be destroyed. He said... This is a direct quote. I beg of you, for one night, give us one night to show the world what we had and our legacy can live forever. I beg of you. I could have sworn in the same fucking segment he said that he had his closure at one night stand. Right. In fact, not only did he say that, but he added, I really did. <laughs> now he needs more closure. Sure. And the only person that can bring in that closure is Dixie. And she said, I'll do it, but I've just got one stipulation for you men. You guys have to plan it. You've got complete control. 
And you've got to do it the right way. It has to be real and nothing to do with TNA. Well, that's a plus. So the fans chanted Sabu, and then Dreamer said, Impact Zone, we're going extreme. And that was the end. Q, Jerry McDivitt. This show, all about ECW. Yes. They they used the term ECW. Mm -hmm. They called them the former ECW guys. They the called fans them Tommy chanted Dreamer. ECW. <laughs> Well, I think Tommy Dreamer has got the rights to his name. Oh, good. But regardless, all of this was just like, this was using the intellectual property of world wrestling entertainment. Okay? It just was. And maybe they'll get around it. Maybe they won't. I don't know. But I fully expect to go to the website tomorrow when I wake up and see massive lawsuit filed against TNA, company going bankrupt, or some such bullshit. But this segment... A lot of people hated it more than I did. It was pathetically phony bullshit. Like, it's one of those things where I didn't believe a goddamn word anybody said. Of course not. I didn't no. believe a goddamn word that came out of Tommy Dreamer's mouth. Actually, I believed everything Dixie said, because she's naive and clueless. But... Rhino looked like he was about to fall asleep. Yeah. Raven looked like he may have been in a coma. Yes. Stevie Richards looked like he was thinking what he was going to teach his class tomorrow in history. And who else was left there? Uh, Am I missing anybody? Stevie. Mick Foley. Mick Foley was just a sad state of affairs. This whole thing was just like, I don't know. It was just sad. Just sad. This is their big angle. This is another way. the second week in a row where I just, I just put myself in Paul Heyman's shoes. And I thought, if I were Paul Heyman right now, first off, I'd have a hat on. Second off, I'd be watching this and just going, what the fuck? What the fuck is this? Why would I ever come in to do this? Yes. And know. there's no good reason. So I am left also with one final question. Why do they attack Abyss? I, if it's not an invasion... They they, they, they just, needed to they they were caught up in the heat of the moment. If they just wanted to ask this Dixie for a chance to have a show, <laughs> why did they have to beat up Abyss? They were and caught up all the agents in the heat of the moment. <laughs> yeah, that battle royal that ended last week's show now makes no sense. No, yeah. Vince, come on now. I swear you're full of shit. So anyway, yeah, this is impact. It's everybody. impact, everybody. This is impact. It's, no. it's a lame show. <laughs> I don't care anymore. <laughs> yes, exactly. I I don't even care enough to to. I just don't care. I did anymore. get angry during the Nash Jarrett segment, but other than that, I just don't care. I didn't even really get angry. I was just like, I have no idea what's going on, and I don't care. Well, I, I was angry because I tried to figure it out, and that was my mistake. You should, should not, I not have bothered to do know that. better by now. To the back! Vinny is not here tonight. He's out of town. And guess who happens to be in town this particular evening? <laughs> it's a huge upgrade, Landstorm. <laughs> I was giving you the offices, they say, in this business. <laughs> and right. I missed it. Stare at you for a while, and then it gets uncomfortable, and then finally someone speaks. Now, Lance is here, everybody. He's in town, and we went to dinner tonight, and, and uh, many friends and family members there. Granny was there. Of course, he didn't bring your Granny's gang shirt. so uh, <laughs> Which got me heat. Yeah, you got heat from Granny. As noted, we went to dinner, and then... I was like, Lance, why not come over and watch Impact? And I broke the boycott and agreed. Actually, the, I, I, sent you, I sent you a text. And as everybody knows, if they use text messaging or the Internet, whenever you type something, you know, sometimes you'll read something that somebody typed, and maybe you're in a bad mood, and so you read it, and so it sounds like they must be in a bad mood, or vice versa. So anyway, I just sent you this text. I... I I didn't even really think that you'd say yes at all. Uh, it was almost, I don't want to say it was a joke, because I thought, you know, this would be cool if I could talk him into doing this. But I sent you the text, and you just responded, sure. And I thought, huh, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, he took the bait. So, yep, we came out here, we watched Impact, and this was your first Impact in how long? Uh, would have been whatever the um, the chair shot to Rob Terry from Homicide. Oh God! Whatever the hell that ago. was when I, I finally had enough is enough and tapped out. That was a ways back. Yes, it's been a lot of months, and I should have just kept going. Yeah, I know some people are going to say, "Oh, I knew that Lance was going to uh, 
break his boycott and that sort of thing. But I'll say it right here. I talked Lance into doing this. And, well, I feel terrible about it. <laughs> You've got more heat with me than I have with Granny. You know, it's funny. I did realize when I was watching this with you, you haven't watched it in a long time. You know, I really am at the point where I just do not give a fuck about this show anymore. Like, there were still things on this show that, that were actually making you angry. And I was almost giggling because it's like I'm so beyond caring. You know, there were a couple of things on this show that I actually had to stop myself from, from, from really getting mad. But I just don't care anymore. Even Dave has given up. If you've read any of Dave's impact reports, dude's completely given up. So, yeah, this was a your average impact show. Hey, you wouldn't know because you haven't been watching it. But, like, per impact standards, this was all right. Yeah, although I'm, I think I'm officially the bitter old guy now because it wasn't just the booking that was driving me crazy. It was actually the psychology or lack thereof in a lot of the matches that I'm just was just shaking my head and shaking my head and getting angry. And my wife's laughing at me with you getting angry. You're not going <laughs> to sleep tonight. Yes, you you in fact did get angry at like the best match on the show. Yes, the beer money match. Yes, yes. For those of you that uh, thought the beer money match was awesome, you're gonna you're gonna hear Lance's side of the story tonight. And now, granted, I thought for an impact match, this was a pretty damn good match. But based on, you know, you made very valid points about. Well, I guess the best way to put it is, if if these people would have done, if they would have done this match in a different fashion. It would have even been better. Very That's slightly different, it would have been much better, yes. You you, you found far more things to hate than I did, but I will say that my pet peeve in cage matches is when you do the fucking tag team match in a cage and you have two dudes politely standing on the apron. Well, especially when they start with the big four-way brawl. Because that, that's something I, I've had happen a lot of times where you have tag matches. Like, okay, let's start hot and just get into a big melee. I'm like... Well, then how do we settle down and have somebody just sit on the damn apron while we get heat on somebody? Yeah. And at least with a regular match, you can sort of jump into the four-way, have two guys spill out, and sort of do the, whoa, 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 time out, time out, and you sort of let the ref get a grip of it. But in a cage, you can't because they're all just in there. So it does seem really weird, weird when they just stop fighting and go stand in the corners. I've, I've seen them do that before. They used to do it in ECW, and, and I, I used to... I used to use the term that, you know, it, it broke down into a tag match. Because <laughs> they've done it in ECW, and they they would do it. I'm sure it's been done in TNA in some sort of, of, of no disqualification tag match. But it, it annoys me because they'll start with, like, a big brawl. And they'll all be brawling, and they'll be the hitting crowd. each other with shit, and it'll go on for, like, ten minutes. And then finally, for some reason, everyone just ends up on the apron. Why? Why are you all standing on the apron here? And then, of course, it breaks down into four, which is what exactly what happened in this match. But we'll get in that match in a minute. Let's start here from the beginning because there's much to talk about. Dreamer came out with his crew, Foley, Rhino, Stevie, Devon, and Raven. And they announced that due to some legal complications. I love that term, complications. We were blatantly infringing on their copyright, so this is a complication that we've that has arisen here. So they had to change their name to EC EV, EV 2.0. 2.0. That's right. EV Extreme Version 2.0. Which actually maybe Matt Hardy will I was going to say shouldn't Matt Hardy be upset about this this thing here but so yeah, it's EV 2.0 and which the crowd miraculously actually chanted. They did. At one point they chanted and I thought they would just chant like EV2. No, EV 2.0 they chanted. So Dreamer talked to Devon, and he wanted to know what was up with Bubba. So Devon calls out Bubba, who, as you noted, is looking trimmer. Yeah. Although you did notice everyone's looking trimmer. So, yeah, so maybe it's just my TV, but everybody looked good. Maybe your or at TV least here. thinner. Well, actually, Bubba is, from his peak, he has lost weight. So he came out, and, uh, and they tried to talk him into doing this. There was a reference to Kiss. Kiss. Everybody, <laughs> this is the Kiss reunion tour. This is the Kiss reunion tour. So, and Kiss, I don't even know how old the people in Kiss are, but uh, they got to be older than these ECW guys. So I guess they were they were saying, you, you know, you guys are near sixty here. So he comes out and and everyone tries to talk Bubba into getting involved, and Taz stands up and says, "Listen to me, just do it." We had what Dave said was the shout out to you, where I believe it was uh, somebody said, uh, you know... It was Mick. Mick, you look back on your career, and someday you're going to regret not doing this. And 
Your wife said, no, you won't. And no, I think the biggest regret will be right. not getting their ECW paychecks. But but yeah. they promised they'd set somebody on fire, so Bubba said he'd do it. Yeah, that's what he said. They, they said, are we going to set someone on fire? And Devon said, yes, Bubba, we will. So now they've teased that on the pay-per-view someone is going to be lit ablaze. So we know either Balls Mahoney or Spike Dudley is booked. I guess, I guess so. So anyway, everybody cheered, and there was the EV 2.0 chant. And then out came Hulk Hogan who had the fucking best line ever. They write the shit and they don't even realize how stupid it is. Hogan comes out and he says, I agree with Dixie when she said that you guys meant to the 90s what I meant to the 80s. <laughs> he then proceeds to say that I remember back in the 90s I had a black beard, I was hanging and banging, this and that. He essentially said, I never had time to watch ECW. Yeah, he said, I missed it. I, I was, I was too busy in my own world. So we, these guys were so big in the 90s, Hogan didn't bother watching it. So he said he and Eric had a special surprise they would announce later, at which point Abyss came out, and he said they were not happy with what was going on. He said they were downright pissed off, not at Dreamer, not at Hogan even. They were pissed off at Dixie Carter. Dixie, still the centerpiece of this fucking ECW angle. She was in the audience. She glanced at him. Dixie, how many times was Dixie on the show tonight, would you estimate? Six. And how many times did she change her facial expression? None. Zero. Every time Dixie Carter... In fact, there was a segment later on the show we'll talk about with Bischoff where he was being all smarmy and kissing her ass. And I don't know if he was supposed... To, I don't know what he was supposed to be, but they kept cutting to Dixie, and she had the same goddamn look on her face that she'd had throughout the entire rest of the show. And I was like, what are we supposed to be feeling here? What are we supposed to be thinking that she's thinking? Because I have absolutely no idea. No, but I was like that a lot of the show, so... So anyway, they, uh, they're mad at Dixie... And strict orders to take out Dreamer, and he said that he was going to take him out, and once he did, there would be no pay-per-view. I don't know how that works. And Hogan said, you know, you can't have a match with Dreamer. He's not working until the pay-per-view. And, of course, Dreamer, being a horrendous booker, said, no, <laughs> I will work Abyss tonight on Impact for free. So there you go. Yes, the only guy so far in this whole ECW angle that hadn't wrestled in TNA, yeah. that the pay-per-view would actually be special to get to see him. He wrestled here tonight with no build it, for free. It gets better later as well. It does. When we get to that, man. And I love Tommy, but my God. We had another bitchy segment with the beautiful people. Madison was trying to get them back together. Velvet would have none of it. Lacey was there acting dumb. Or maybe she's just really dumb. May I don't not, know. May not be acting, but yes, yeah, she was begging. So they, they bitched and bitched and bitched. And Velvet wanted nothing to do with her, and Madison kept begging. And then Velvet just all of a sudden said, okay, and they hugged. Group hug. Group hug. Presumably oh. she's turning on her next week. I haven't even read the spoilers. If I did, I didn't care enough to follow up. But I just – remember when the beautiful people, how great they were? Yeah, they were the like literally the best segment on the show and probably the best female act since Trish retired. And now completely insufferable. Pretty much. Completely insufferable. We had Angelina against Sarita, which was... First match on the show. Yeah. You know, it was an acceptable match for Impact Standards. They uh, they did some stuff. Angelina made her come back. Her super kick is called the Botox Injection, which we were trying to figure out what that meant. My, my best guess was that she kicks you so hard it knocks the wrinkles off your face. Sure. I which I, all the girls would be wanting to wait in line for that move. But... Sarita is not the best at working the American style, so, you know, she's great at rolling bumps and lucha. She's not great at feeding for American style comebacks, and that's kind of what hurt this match, but I've seen right. worse. It was an all right match. It was fine. Eric Young is acting like a dumbass in the back. Oh, my God. They said he was teaming with Orlando Jordan tonight. <laughs> You've already got the Sam the Eagle face on right here. <laughs> Eric has just been so many... You know, he was, he was a Canadian, and then he, I think, defended the Americans for a little while and wouldn't burn the flag or something, I think. And then he went, he was just a 12-year-old retard. He was Eugene's younger brother. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden he was just a badass guy that had led a global faction and then was tagged with, and now he's just a retard again. Yeah, he was, he was a member of, of the band for a while. Yeah. You ever remember that? Probably not. So the storyline is that on Explosion, 
he was on the top rope, and Suicide gave him a kick to the head, and he proceeded to essentially do a belly flop off the buckle to the mats outside. Yes. What a fucking idiot. Yeah, basically taking the bump you would if you were doing a headbutt from there, yeah. Yeah, so he lands on the ground, and now the storyline is that his head has been fucked up. <laughs> it's a concussion storyline, everyone. His head's so fucked up that now he's an idiot. Yes, yeah. and it's played for comedy. 2010, comedy here. And by the way, I, I don't want to make brain damage jokes, but, you know, if you're going to say the guy's brain damaged, you say he's brain damaged, and that's why he took that fucking bump. That yes. was obscene. Then we had Eric in Orlando against Ink Ink. Orlando had a pink mouthpiece in, and he came to the ring. It was gum. It was it gum? It was gum he was chewing and then stuck it in SoCal Val's mouth. Regardless, there was, there was something pink in his mouth, and he put that in SoCal Val's mouth. Unacceptable. So, let me tell you a story. <laughs> this, okay. is, this is a fucking terrible story. It's just terrible. So, I was uh, I was at the gym today coaching. And my kids are all like, one's 11, I think his older brother's like 12, and I think the other one's 12. So I'm trying to teach him how to do a dive roll onto these mats, which is just, picture Jeff Hardy senton, except you roll out of it. I'm trying to teach him, but with good form, unlike Jeff Hardy. So I'm trying to teach him this dive roll, and like, you know, the first kid lands in a handstand and then falls like a tree. And the second guy's all crunched up in a ball, and he rolls out. The second guy rolls too fast and goes ass over tea kettle, and his feet hit the mat, and he flops up. I'm like, Jesus Christ. So I decide I'm going to show them with a visual aid what I want their body to look like. So there happen to be right behind them these, these, these foam, like it's a foam stick. It's about... Yay big. No one could see that except Lance. Yeah. Just, just two feet or so, everybody. Just imagine about two feet, and it's about as big around as, what would you say, a pop can or something like that. But it's made of foam. So it's it's like this. Anyway, the point was, the one the kid happened to grab for me was pink. And it also happened to be slightly curved. So he hands it to me, and, of course, they don't want to say anything. You know what I mean? These are young boys. This is this is already completely fucked up. So he gives it to me, and I just decide to pretend like there's nothing awry here. There's nothing out of the ordinary about this thing. So I get the mat, and I say, and I hold it up in front of him, and I say, pretend this is your body. And I'm holding it, and they're looking at it, and they're trying really hard not to smile, and I don't want to say anything but everybody knows what everybody else is thinking. And so finally, I just stopped and I said, give me another color. <laughs> and they, they all laughed and they gave me another color and on we went. But anyway, that's why I thought of that with Orlando Jordan here. Uh, terrible, terrible. Everything about that story was terrible. But So anyway, he puts it in her mouth. They have a match. Eric Young comes out with a blow-up doll. No, it was a, or a mannequin. Dummy. Mannequin. A mannequin of some sort. From like a clothing store. He's got a fucking mannequin on the apron, and the mannequin's got one arm extended. So, of course, to get the tag. They're wrestling Ink Ink. They have a shitty match. Oh, my God. <laughs> Tell us about this match. There was nothing. Orlando just sort of forearmed him a few times, and he forearmed him back a few times, and then they did the tag spot with the mannequin. Yeah. It was just a complete waste of time for a joke about a mannequin. Yeah. Uh, Orlando went to make the tag to Eric, but Eric moved the mannequin in front, so Orlando tagged a mannequin. Of course, the mannequin's not legal, so the ref said it wasn't legal. Uh, I believe Orlando punched Eric, and then Ink Ink pinned Orlando. This was god-awful wretched, I wrote, and the only good thing about this, and it pains me that I laughed at this. <laughs> no, you did not find it funny, but the arms fell off the mannequin, and so Eric Young held up the dreaded X sign to the back. Yes. Just, that was uh, funny. It's funny you if, you want, for if you want your whole show to be a comic joke that doesn't draw any money, then yeah, it's funny. Well, this match had already failed. Yeah, the match wasn't drawing money already, but still, oh, God. Although he did throw the mannequin for a crossbody off the top rope, which Shannon Moore managed to duck. <laughs> he did duck, thank God. Yes, and Shannon did manage to pin the bisexual with the morgasm. So, That's right. Yes. This was, this was move is called. Flair in the ring with AJ Kazarian and Beer Money. 
And he announced that next week he was going to be getting his rematch against Jay Lethal in a street fight. Now, if you need even one guess to figure out what the finish of this match is going to be, then you've not watched enough TNA Impact. So he welcomed Beer Money into the fold. They did a promo saying they were going to become four-time tag champs. Introduced AJ as the global champion. AJ said that they were the best because Flair deserved the best and he deserved respect. I don't know what that means, but that's what he said. And then he announced that he was going to make this belt mean something. He said no matter where you were in the world, if you had a TV, you were going to see this title defended every single week. It is now going to be the TNA TV title. And then he didn't defend it this week. That's, that's true. His, his, his third name change, it was the Legends title, and then the Global title, and now the TV title. And the reason it's going to be the TV title, everybody, is because he said that we all know, he said, what drives wrestling, and of course, I immediately knew what he was going to say. Not money, not buy rates, not how show, how show revenue. No, what drives wrestling is ratings. And coincidentally, ratings do not drive TNA at all. But anyway, because they drive ratings, he's going to defend the title. He'll defend it against Rob Terry next week. And then Kurt Angle came out and said, unfortunately for AJ, he was next in line. All I can presume, since Angle's career is on the line with all these matches, is that Kurt Angle is going to win the TV title, and now he's going to have to wrestle at every single taping. Unless AJ drops it back to Rob Terry next week. He doesn't. Oh, great. Well, I'd rather him not. But <laughs> yeah. yeah. Could Rob Terry re- defending the title every week? Ooh, there you go. There's money. Yeah. So basically they just iced this title, I think. Sure. Does it mean anything? Well, no. We had beer money against the machine guns in a cage match. And I actually said, oh, at least this will be good as soon as it started. They did a lot of moves. They did the fans, a lot of moves. The fans liked the moves. They did. Yeah. Me, on the other hand, did not. Tell us about this match. Okay. And, yeah, I, okay, I'm old, I'm bitter, I'm out of touch, the business has passed me by, but Robert Rude bled. They yes. busted him open when he was standing on the apron. How did they do this, by the way? I was in the bathroom. They drop kicked him in the back. He went head first into the cage. I see. And he's bleeding on the apron. Okay. And this was the point where they decided to go back to a regular tag match. Yeah. So the regular tag match broke out when Robert Roode got busted open and pretty big. Oh, yeah. And so since it broke out into a tag match, once this match got violent and bloody... Robert Roode just stood on the apron while the other guys that weren't bleeding wrestled in the ring. Mm-hmm. And then James Storm managed to cut off... Shelly. Shelly. And Roode just got in and started beating him up because it was the heat. Mm-hmm. So the guy that got busted open bloody on, you know, wrestling on his deathbed, Spirit of 76, was the heel that was never selling while he was bloody. Yeah. Making the blood completely pointless. And all four guys in the match should know this. And why you would add blood to a match to detract from the emotion of a match when blood is supposed to bring some emotion to the match. Either that babyface fighting spirit of 76 to overcome this ass whooping, or again, when the babyface makes his big comeback and lays such an ass whooping on this heel that deserves his comeuppance, for lack of a different word. But no, he got busted open, he stood on the apron, tagged in, and then beat the living shit out of Sally, Shelly. And then to make it better... Selly is actually... Selly. Yes, he's... Well, that's when he's Selly. When he's <laughs> he was, on offense, he's Shelly. When he's getting beat up, he's Selly. He was Selly McSellerson. And then as soon as they made the hot tag to Saban, Robert Roode, the guy that was waiting, tagged out. And again, the when the babyfaces were on offense, the heel in the ring was the one that wasn't bleeding and selling. Yeah. So the blood was completely... The complete opposite of what it should have been, distracted from the match... And just drove me completely insane because it was there just for the sake of having it there. Now, perhaps he was busted open a hard way. No. Okay. Because <laughs> I called it before he did it because you could see it. I see. Now, now, all the blood aside, you also took exception to the comeback. Yeah. And again, I'm old, I'm bitter, I know. Don't bury me on the board. You're all fucking wrong. Sorry, Granny. Sorry, Granny. A whole bunch of moves... And I think there was only one or two covers for near falls. Mm -hmm. Again, if a match is going to mean anything, and these are the titles? They have titles? Who has the titles? 
Machine guns have the titles, which Machine are guns have randomly the titles defending in the best in the series. Of, yeah. Okay, so your titles are on the line. You're down two to nothing, I believe. Mm -hmm. And they hit all these great crazy moves, including a crossbody off the top of the cage. And they didn't even bother to do a cover to tease winning. Yeah. Which, how are the moves going to matter if they don't try to win with them? They just do them for the sake of, and yes, the crowd love them. The moves are great. I actually love all four of these guys. They're great. But if they'd have covered and done near falls, we could have had a dozen near falls and the crowd, the crowd counting one, two, oh, when they kick out. And we could make the people think that this match is important and it's not just an array of moves. Oh my god, I, I hated it. <laughs> there was a whole bunch of stuff that was done really well and I hated it. It could have been a lot better. It sh and that's why I hated it. That it was yeah, it was fun, but it didn't really mean what it should have. It didn't have the drama that it should have. It didn't have me on the edge of my seat like it should have and could have, with only a few minor changes. And I refuse to believe that these four guys don't know that. Mm. And if they don't, who are the agents? Oh, well, we know who the agents are. They're incompetent. Yes, but it's not their job to know they're doing. So that's okay. Exactly. They, yeah. Well, I mean, they were busy because they all had they all had spots on the they show. They all had segments to do. Yeah. Yes. They, they had important they had important work to do, so they couldn't put these matches together. You know, the only the only potential I don't know if this actually happened or not. I'm, in fact, I don't think it did. But I mean, knowing how they put this fucking show together, I mean, there could have been near falls, and they decided to edit them out, which at least. Would defend the wrestlers. It would defend the wrestlers, yes, and the agents, and it would just be the people in the truck are completely retarded. I don't think I, I, I mean, if anyone was there, you can tell me, but uh, I don't think they did that because the 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 editing was was too seamless for TNA, if you ask me. So yeah, that was the match, and the uh, basically the finish was uh, actually you know the one thing that um, they did do one near fall. Uh, that actually was great, the uh, the double backcracker spot. But it almost annoyed me because it was so great that the, the man kicked out. I was like, that would have been a fucking awesome finish. But obviously the guns had to win. Anyway, they uh, Storm tried to hit Saban with a beer bottle, accidentally hit Rude, and then Shelly and Saban hit their uh, double team uh, big splash off the top of the pin. So fans went nuts for it, so the people here at the Impact Zone at least liked it. But we had Matt Morgan coming out for an insufferable segment. Ooh, this was long. Matt Morgan came out and did a Mr. Anderson spoof. He actually sounded more like Val Venus when he did his mic work. Supposed to be a heel, but the people that were cheering, well, the, the few people that were reacting were cheering. The rest did not care. Then the real Anderson came out, and Morgan was upset that the real Anderson had interrupted him spoofing Anderson. So <laughs> Morgan begs him to... Punch, punch him in the face. He goes, come on, give, give me a good shot. I'm, I'll give me my, my jaw here. Punch me. So Anderson responds by squatting down and punching him in the balls. So Anderson, the baby face, punches him in the balls and is beating on him a bit. And he beats on him, he beats on him, he beats on him. And finally Matt Morgan makes a comeback by opening up his hand and putting the claw, the claw, on the face of Mr. Anderson. Just grabbed him by the head with one hand. So the babyface punched the heel in the balls, and the heel started making his own comeback. So, of course... By just grabbing his head. Yeah, he just gave him the squeeze. So, of course, now another babyface, Jeff Hardy, had to run down to make the save. So it was now two-on-one advantage babyfaces. This used to outrage me. Now I just laugh. Over and over they do this shit. So he comes out, and then they sent out security guards to break it up. Beat the shit out of the baby faces. Yeah. The one guy just grabbed Jeff and threw him to the floor, and Jeff just stayed there and sold. Yeah. The security guy. Security guy beat up the baby faces, and then they sent out the agents to break it up and chew out the security. Now, Lance, you asked a very good question about the agents. Yes. If, if this were real, what exactly is the agent's job? When I heard that Dixie had the meeting with the agents... I'm like, well, what? Although, granted, they they actually did walk in on the writing room once on Impact way they back did. when, yeah. and Mick Foley actually actually I think asked them to write a segment where Dixie returned his phone calls. Yeah. So they they've yeah they've all but you know thrown the curtain and set it on fire and everything else. But the agent's job is to take what the creative writing team tells them and then go explain it to the boys and help them put together again, for lack of a different term, how to put their fake matches together. Mm-hmm. 
And there are characters on the show now. Then it gets better. Christy is backstage with Anderson and Hardy, asking him, you know, what the hell happened out there? You know, you guys were beat up by security. So Anderson said, he really said this, security guys, Murphy and Gunner, that's her names, had been trying for 10 years to get into TNA and had to settle with being security guards. Actually, hold on. No, he said they've been struggling for 10 years to get into the business. Oh, the business. And the best they could do was TNA. Security, security. guards. Yes. Yeah. There was a pause that I was actually waiting with. He's not. He didn't just say that. The best they could do was TNA. But, yeah, it was just a pause, and he said the best they could do was TNA security. So the guys that just beat the hell out of the two, two of the top baby face in this company are 10 years struggling jobbers that couldn't succeed could not even make explosion nope they're security guys so he challenged them to a handicap match later Kazarian and Rob Terry first spot you want to talk about the first spot (laughs) yeah oh and I know I'm bitter I'm old but AJ distracted uh muscle guy what's his name Rob Rob Terry and Kazarian, being the heel, decides, well, I should probably jump him from behind because my partner's distracted him. But instead of just punching him in the back of the head or jumping him in a heel dastly fashion, he throws a really nice drop kick. Yeah. Which, of course, the crowd will appreciate the really nice drop kick. I'm like, heels don't need moves. Just be dastardly and attack him from behind and get heat. I had a on my indie show, the PWA up in Edmonton. It was a heel guy that in a tag match. Oh, this great spot. I'm going to distract this guy with the ref. I'm going to hit him with this hurricane rana. I'm like, why don't you just be a heel? What do you need to do here a hurricane rana? Oh, I think it would be a cool move. It's like heels don't do cool moves. But to be dastardly and generate heat by jumping from behind, he threw a really sweet drop kick. You know, the the new thing, I shouldn't say new, it's about four or five years old, but in WWE, it was Edge and Jericho uh, were both two guys that did this. Their Their deal was... I'm going to be a heel, and I'm going to have no redeeming qualities. There's going to be nothing about me that people could cheer. That was their idea. They wanted to be heels. They didn't want to have the opportunity there for people to see something cool and cheer. My big pet peeve with, I mean, there's a lot of them with TNA, but AJ Styles is supposed to be this heel. In every fucking match, he does every babyface spot that he always did, and the people always go nuts for it. Well, that's why I, I, you know, I cut a rant forever when they turned him heels because everything that makes AJ Styles stand out and be special is cool. Mm-hmm. So if he's going to do what makes him stand out and is special, people will cheer for him. So he should not be a heel. Terribly miscast. Well, yeah, and I think the the best, you know, and again, when you talk about no redeeming qualities, JBL. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, a lot of his style was because it had to be that style because he's not exactly the most acrobatic. A uh, beautiful, graceful worker, but he just punched and kicked people, and people booed him for it, mm-hmm. and left the nice-looking stuff to his baby faces. Yeah, novel, novel theory here of of professional wrestling. That leads us to Morgan and the security geeks against Anderson and Hardy. Mike Tenay said of the security guards, this is a direct quote: "They have a wrestling background and an athletic background as well." Yes, because we all know wrestling is not athletic. It's scripted entertainment that nobody should give a shit about. Just ask the announcers and writers of DNA. The big guy was Murphy, and the smaller guy was Gunner. And I, I had mentioned that he's aptly Murphy. named Murphy, because when he wrestles, Murphy Law is well in effect. I just couldn't help but think of Granny's Murphy bed. There you go. His although, name is Murphy. Although I don't recall anything standing out as being bad that they did. God bless, yeah, actually, well, I thought Gunner was, was perfectly acceptable. Murphy, I thought, was a little bit clumsy. Like, he did a couple of moves and fell down. But uh, no. I, I thought Gunner was, you know, I was expecting, I was just like, oh, these fucking security guys, this is going to be good. And then Gunner went in there, and he was perfectly fine. And he was working with Anderson. So that's real. That's telling you something. So they got the heat on Anderson via hair pull. <laughs> he was buzz cut. Oh, he's a good one. Well, they did successfully detract the ref. That's true. That is that is true. Yes. That they did a better job distracting the ref than anyone's done on this show in, in a decade. But now. Anderson ran the ropes, and one of the security guys grabbed him by the hair. Yeah. 
He's got really small fingers. Yeah, he's got like tweezer-like tendon strength. And Anderson bumped. So Morgan, Morgan ends up walking on his team, but he walks out on them while they had the heat. Yeah, Apparently he was, he's he upset. Was, he was there the whole time when they were getting their butts handed to them, but as soon as things were going their way, he had enough, and he left. Yeah. So as soon as he left, Anderson hit the mic check out of nowhere on Gunner, and Hardy hit the senton for the pin. And just so I can bitch about everything, just because I know you guys can enjoy me bitching, Anderson and Hardy are two fairly top baby faces. Mm-hmm. They got cut off three times by these... Ten-year geeks that can't make it in the business. Murphy and Gunner. Murphy and Gunner got cut off three times by these geeks. Didn't get a hot tag or make a comeback. Yeah. They just hit the moves out of nowhere on one and got very little reaction because of it. We had one of those awesome segments where Chrissy's backstage with Hogan. She wants to scoop on Bischoff's big announcement. Now, keep in mind, hindsight, obviously, we saw what the next segment was going to be, but when she went to find... Hogan, Bischoff was in the ring ready to make his announcement. But she had to get the scoop from Hogan first. So she goes up to him and she said, it'd be awesome if, if we heard what the announcement was. And and Hogan said, it's going to be awesome and the fans are going to freak out when they hear it. And he said, but I, I got to go. I've got a big meeting in New York I've got to go to right now. <laughs> this is 10.30 at night. 10.30 p.m. on a Thursday night. Hogan's got to catch a plane from New York. I just love that. It's like, I always love the idea that you know, guys can't be there because they're somewhere else. Yes, because there's so many things more important than the show. I mean, is that hard to show up for your job once a week? You know? Yeah, although in TNA's defense, WWE does it as well. I know, but it's always so stupid. Yes, they've got meetings scheduled between 9 and 11 on Thursday. It's the only time they can get away. Christy tried to interview... Oh, yeah, you got that one. Bishop in the ring with Brooke to do his uh, goofy announcement. Miss uh, Teschmacher, I believe, is the name. I, I still have not one time written her name in this newsletter. Wasn't she... Brooke. Yeah, but she ECW was... Brooke. Yeah, but the actual name, isn't that from like a Mel Brooks movie or a I was Gene Hackman movie? I was like, just going to ask where that name came from. If I, anybody knows, email I'm having us. visions of like maybe young Frankenstein with uh, Gene, uh, Gene Wilder for some reason. I that movie, believe it or not. Long time ago, but... So he's out there with her. And his hair was astounding. I don't know what he did, but I could not stop looking at it. He said an old friend had always told him, quote, the end always hangs on the beginning. I don't know what that means. He did not explain. He just moved on. On August 12th, he said, something big is going to happen. He said Dixie had motivated him to give something back to the fans. He was acting all smarmy, trying to claim every idea she had was just phenomenal. Said he'd talk to Spike, they used to raise the bar, probably shoot. And he said they were going to be giving the fans pay-per-view quality action here on Impact. And this was where they kept cutting to Dixie, and she had the exact same look on her face every single time they cut to her. I have no earthly idea what uh, what we were supposed to think. But, yeah, just to recap, the groundbreaking announcement was, we're going to try to do a better show so on August 12th, we're going to give you a show that might actually be good. Yeah. Yeah, they're doing, as noted, I, I talked about this with Dave. They already taped the go-home show. And unless they insert some segments in it, you know, the go-home show is going to end with two matches announced for the pay-per-view and three matches announced for the free TV. That is astounding. And big matches. Abyss came out, and he said that they wanted him to make the main event for that night. And Bischoff was fine with that. I don't know why. The main event is going to be a ladder match, RVD, with the barbed wire board hanging from the ceiling. Ladder match. I guess, I don't know if it's for the title. I don't know what it's for, but they're going to do that. And Abyss said that was fine by him. Actually, Abyss told Eric, you're fine by me, but Janice did not forget when Eric bitch slapped Abyss a few weeks ago. But also, they didn't explain the rules. It's a ladder match. You just get the board. Well, yeah, but he said he was going to get the board and then use it to do something. So it makes you think that it's more of a pole match. <laughs> I was surprised it was not billed as a pole match, to be honest with you. Anyway, I don't remember when Eric bitch slapped uh, Abyss. So the board has a better memory than I do, which should surprise nobody. He was about to kill Eric when RVD ran down to make the save. He ran wild and then did a dive, hit the guardrail. 
Abyss threatened Dixie again. Dixie's all over this fucking show. Agents ran down to make the save with chairs, and that led to Dreamer versus Abyss as the main event. Now, to set this up, Al Snow had come out to break up this brawl, and he confiscated the board with nails in it. And as he's heading to the back, Dreamer comes out and he says, wait, it's a no-DQ match. Give me that board. So Tommy Dreamer grabs a board covered in nails. He starts to head to the ring. They go to commercial. And when they return, the board is nowhere to be seen, and he is hitting Abyss with garbage can lids. Where the fuck is the board? We have no idea. No explanation perhaps, for why he got rid of this weapon. Perhaps they took it. <laughs> they may have. Again, this was Impact Streamer debut. Yes, rather than saving the only guy in this angle so far that hasn't appeared in ECW, or sorry, hasn't appeared in TNA, instead of saving him for the pay-per-view, we'll put him in a hardcore match right now. Right now. He wrestled Abyss. They had every, they had every goofy hardcore match you've ever seen. They hit each other with garbage can lids. They did this and that. Finally, Dreamer brings a board covered in barbed wire mm-hmm. to the ring. Keep in mind, much like the tag match, most of these crazy, wacky spots with hitting people's stuff resulted in no near falls. No near falls. There was one off, I believe, a crossbody. The, the best one. And a punch. The punch, yes. They, Dreamer had been hitting him with every possible accoutrement, and suddenly, out of the blue, he punches him. Now, keep in mind, Dreamer's put on MMA gloves, so he's now wearing 8-ounce gloves or whatever. He punches Abyss for a near fall. So I thought that would have been quite great if, after hitting with every single piece of plunder on the face of the impact zone, he would have pinned him with a punch from a padded glove. Yes, and one thing I do want to point out in case someone decides to dig up the Hardcore Heaven Hardcore patch I did with Dreamer, in the event that we did all kinds of crazy, goofy spots and didn't get covers... It's because it was 12 years ago, and I didn't know any better back then. (laughs) And now you do. And now I do. And apparently no one else learned any lessons. So they did their moves. Uh, They did their goofiness. The board was brought into the ring. Uh, Abyss tried to hit him with the board, but he hit the buckle instead. And Tommy went for a schoolboy where Abyss had nothing to sell whatsoever for a near fall. Yeah, schoolboy. So he kicked out, and Dreamer got up. I think a garbage can or something like that. Anyway, Abyss punched it into his face and then choke slammed it onto the barbed wire board for the pin. Yes. Tommy Dreamer pinned. 0-1 in TNA. 0-1 in TNA. That is your build towards the hardcore Justice pay-per-view coming up on August 8th or whatever the date it is. So, yeah. Oh, and then afterwards they had the big angle, which was uh, Abyss grabbed the board and Raven ran down, supposedly to make the save. But, of course... If anybody did not think that Tommy Dreamer was going to get turned on here, then I don't even know where you've been. It, it's just, you must have never watched this show before in your life. But yes, Raven turned on Dreamer. They are still feuding over a incident from 1995. That is your uh, semi-main event on the Hardcore Justice pay-per-view underneath RVD and Jerry Lynn. And actually, Lance, this would be a good time to to cut to you. You recently teamed with Jerry Lynn. I and, did. Uh, how is his match with RVD going to be? It's probably going to be pretty damn good. Yeah. Jerry, Jerry can still still go and then some. Um, I think the only possible downfall is the bar is so high because it was so amazing a decade ago um, that having those guys try to um, redo that and live up to the, the legend that they had before is going to be tough on them. Mm. And in defense of the Raven Dreamer thing, it's like if you're going to do a – EV 2.0 reunion show, Dreamer and Raven probably is the match to do. And it's a fine battle. Yes. You know, if, if you're going to do a reunion show, uh, Rob and RVD, or Rob and Jerry's probably the way to go, and Dreamer Raven's probably the way to go. So that's, they're, they're, they're going towards the right matches, which is good. But I wouldn't have beaten Tommy on this show. <laughs> and next week, guess who, guess who returns, or de- debuts actually the Impact Zone? No idea. The Sandman. Ooh. You didn't hear about the end of next week's impact? No, I did not. I got to tell you here because it's uh, it's classic. It ends with EV 2.0 and Hulk Hogan having a beer bash. All righty then. <laughs> That's the go-home angle for the pay-per-view. Hogan having a beer with Sandman. Yeah. 
All righty then. <laughs> Come on, everybody. I mean, it was going to be great on television. I don't know. I say that every week and it never is, but you just never 